All right, so good evening, everybody. Welcome to the February um, um, 15th meeting of the Board of Education. It is 8.07. Do I have a motion to return to public session? Jennifer first, do I have a second? We are back in public session. Um, and uh, we have no minutes this evening, and we have no treasurer's report. Uh, recognition of community. Uh, so let me just turn to our community that is present in person. Um, does anybody have a comment they would like to share with us this evening? Yes. Okay. State your name and go to the podium, please. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, back. Yeah. Please, please project as much as you can. The microphone's actually there. The oh, there's not working right now. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, I'll project to the map. Uh, the maximum extent possible. So thank you, uh, board, for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Logan Clark, L-O-G-A-N-C-L-A-R-K. I am a resident of the Sealy Place Elementary School District. Um, I reside at 34 Robin Hill. Um, and two individuals you see to my left are, are my neighbors. Um, I believe we have some neighbors as well representing the uh, neighborhood uh, via Zoom. Um, and we're joining you tonight um, to uh, express Bradley. our collective concern about uh, the plans for the proposed traffic circle uh, at this intersection, uh, near the intersection of Robin Hill and Henry Street. Uh, we've had several meetings with the town thus far. We believe them to have been constructive and we're encouraged by the support the town has shown um, to implement supplementary pedestrian safety measures. Um, we believe that <laughs> what's being proposed will, in all likelihood, bring more congestion to a street that is already uh, quite dangerous for kids to traverse. Uh, we've had meetings with the town where we have shown, I don't have uh, <laughs> blown up pictures to show you, but I'm happy to share video and photographic evidence of the extent of the, uh, of the congestion. It is um, quite concerning. Kids are uh, going, having to traverse the middle of the road and have to sidewalk with park, cars parked on either side, um, as it is, again, quite perilous. With the invariable uh, increased congestion that this road traffic circle will bring, uh, concern has reached new highs. So, uh, again, we've worked constructively to leave with the town. The town now has a sidewalk um, that they proposed building and a segment of Robin Hill between Mount Joy and Henry, Henry Street. We believe that's necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, we, we would like to see potentially, in addition to the sidewalk, uh, some parking restrictions implemented on this stretch and the provision of a crossing guard at the corner of uh, Robin Hill and Henry Street. Um, this, is, this is important because this segment serves as a funnel for the children of our whole neighborhood. It is the most downstream point. And so every child who lives on the Robin Hill Loop and Mount Joy and our stretch of uh, Robin Hill uh, has, to, has to run the gauntlet, so to speak, <laughs> uh, twice, twice a day um, during the peak hour. So um, we, we we would like specifically to address the board about the funding and provision of a crossing guard because we recognize that some of these preventative measures are outside your jurisdiction. Um, we first approached the police department, Sergeant, Re Sergeant Rexon Police Department, about the crossing guard option. And um, to put it mildly, we felt that our concerns were not uh, were not acknowledged. Um, we're, 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 Pretty summarily dismissed, to be frank. Um, we later, in conversations with Rich Fong, Department of Public Works, brought this up again. And he said, quite frankly, the town has limited resources. We're already providing a crossing guard at the corner of uh, Mount Joy in Robin Hill. Um, and he said, quite frankly, the, the district has more resources financially than we would. Um, and I later on come to the understanding that there is precedent for school districts to provide traffic safety. Uh, personnel, uh, informal crossing guard rotation among their staff. 
And in fact, this precedent exists within this district at the high school, from what I understand. I don't have children yet at the high school. My oldest is in fourth grade. I have two students, uh, Celia and a preschooler. Um, but that is my understanding is that this is a possibility that could and should be explored um, you know, if it's not possible for the, the district to provide for a full time crossing guard. Um, but we'd like to nevertheless um, work together with the district to, to, to devise an integrated solution. Right? You, what you don't have among neighbors is a group of neighbors who are saying, not in my backyard. We are willing to work with you on a win-win situation that provides benefit to the motorists who need to drive their vehicles to start the children up to school, but also for the residents in the immediate vicinity of the school. Again, I understand your uh, authority is limited jurisdictionally, but pedestrian safety does not stop at the school boundaries. Uh, and so we would definitely like to, to continue the constructive dialogue as we explore these options, and I look forward to doing so. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you. Um, next, and I, my fault, I forgot to say, but it's, it's supposed to be a three minute limit, so I will. Oh, it's okay. Oh, no, 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 that's my bad. I, 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 I will set a timer and give you a heads up. Um, my name is Enid Hillman, H I L L M A N, and I live at 42 Robin Hill Road. I am, I've, I've lived in Edgemont over 40 years. And um, I am on the corner of Robin Hill and Henry Street. Mm -hmm. So basically, I am probably most impacted by everything. I will say that sociologically, it's been interesting for me because this issue has only been recent years. When my daughter was in school, we didn't have this problem with all the cars and drop off and this kind of thing. So it's interesting. My concern is if you have a drop off, where are they feeding in from? Have you really thought about when I go past the high school, it's three o'clock, you can't even go near White Oak Lane. It's all the way to Old Army Road. So I don't understand if the feasibility of how you plan this out. Then I learned just a month ago that a sidewalk was going to be built. And um, my personal thing was that I got rid of all the shrubs because they were too high, got new shrubs, and now found out that the town owns four feet of that and they would have to move that. So it's just we're um, our our block, we've been wonderful. We had a meeting recently. We're very look, I'm very supportive of it being as safe as possible. And um, I'm all for having a crossing guard there, especially. But I just wish that you would really, if you're changing too many things, I think that could be problematic without knowing exactly what the ramifications of all of this is going to be. So that's my main, main concern. I mean, um, I've been supportive of this district and I've lived in that house now for 37 years. So um, I just feel that, and, and the, the, um, the restrictions on the parking, I feel, and we've discussed that it should be very minimal because I have a problem where my driveway is in the back of the house, all the others on the street are in the front. And I have an older husband and it would be difficult if the restrictions were not limited to like an hour in the morning or an hour in the afternoon. But I really think that the town, the police, and the school district are not, they're all working, they're not working together. Everyone has their own um, priorities and they're not really talking and communicating. So I think that's a factor also. But I'm here to help in any way possible. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to? Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Yvonne Lehman. I was here last time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a repeat visitor. Mm -hmm. um, my name is spelled I dash S O N E. My last name is Lehman, L E H M A N. Um, I, I'm 100% supportive in terms of my neighbors here. Um, and I don't have more to add about that topic itself. I just wanted to add a follow up in terms of our discussion last week, which I'm sure it's going to be a discussion today in terms of masking and the options for masking and that policy. Um, it's really in terms of understanding. The provisions in terms of how you're thinking about both the potential of going into a mass option policy, but then as well, really having us understand what it will be in terms of when we need to put masks back on. Like, what is that trigger point? Where, and, and I want to understand because we can have, we're talking about the data in terms of, of supporting why, why and when we can go, go mass, mass optional. Um, and I just want to just make sure that we're thinking 
farther along as well in terms of and, and preparing for that because I, I feel as though it is inevitable. I feel that we use the term endemic and we need to kind of understand that that's now the world that we're living in. And just begging us to kind of consider that and in, in anticipation as opposed to trying to catch up later on down the road. Um, so that that is just what I wanted to um, to share today. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Um, oh, mm -hmm. are you here to make a comment? Uh, no, it's not. It's not necessary. I'm just <laughs> saying, <laughs> you can talk. No, okay. Uh, Please state your name and spell the word uh, Rosemary. No. Hi. Uh, I'm one of the folks that you want to love and hold and. Mount Royal, 36 Mount Royal. Uh, as uh, Logan was saying earlier, uh, that part of the uh, Logan Hill, the church from Mount Royal into Henry Street, it's been problematic for us for the past three and a half years. Uh, we tried to, you know, various uh, prevailing avenues, put some sort of, you know, traffic mitigation in that, in that stretch. And now we finally feel like we have the attention of the town. As you guys mentioned, you know, we, you know, the proposed sidewalk, um, some other matters that we're still looking at. But we feel like the drop off circle in the back of the uh, back of Henry would just make the situation worse. The way we, I look at it is if even if you put a sidewalk, the traffic along the hill from Robin Hill going through the back of Sealy Place would just be, you know. Right now, there is no official drop of that. And uh, Henry Street, right here, Henry Street every day between 8 20, 8 30, exactly. is, or afternoon, is uh, treacherous, right? You cannot even navigate. That, even with the police presence, people are making new friends right in front of the police car. So I feel like another drop off point in the back of the city is just that people are not traveling. Especially when we have walk to school day, right? We have one day a week that is a walk to school day, and it's great. We should have more of this. And now we feel like we put in more, uh, we make it easier for drivers to not walk. That's why I said. Thank you. We should be more friendly to you know, walking people than cars. That's my Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, and is there anybody on the uh, red team? Um, sorry. <clears throat> no, okay. So we can move on to acceptance of gifts, but I don't believe there are any this week. Um, and then to the superintendent's report. Thanks, everyone. Hi. Yes, we're starting with another brief health and safety update. Um, and just like usual, I got some updates today in an email, so I can share some of them with you and iPhone. What they do have to do with uh, some metrics that um, the state of New York is looking at. So just uh, on the masking update, yes, masks still are required and will continue to be required until the school community receives a notification from me or from Ryan, you never know, um, what, from one of us, because what we don't want to happen is have something in the news, have the law change, and then all of a sudden people are unsure what to do. So there will be a communication from the school. Uh, up until that time, <clears throat> masks are still required. We expect that that might change, either by the end of February or early March. Uh, there are two uh, legal issues involved in exactly what that date is. But uh, New York State superintendents have been asking for metrics and today we actually learned about some new metrics. And the governor is looking at uh, public health data, including cases per 100,000 residents, <clears throat> hospital admission rates, vaccination rates, global trends and pediatric hospitalizations. 
So those are the metrics being used to make the decision to unmask schools. And you asked about how would we know to mask again? My expectation would be that those same metrics would be used to make decisions in both directions. Um, in terms of preparing for the mask mandate removal, again, as I mentioned, it would be a, a communication from the school district, but also, so when it becomes mask optional, all of our other mitigation strategies would still remain in place. So right now we're still at three to six feet for social distancing where feasible, not feasible in all places, but where feasible that would remain for those children, especially at the elementary school, who choose, whose families choose for them to keep wearing masks, there will be mask breaks. And um, everything else that's in place, so it would be that one layer of mitigation for people who choose to have their children remove that layer of mitigation would be the one to become optional, the rest would still be in place. So the, the reason for bringing that up this evening is for parents to start thinking about and having conversations with their children about their family values, what's important to them as a, their, their family, what are the family characteristics in terms of who is living in the home, what the, the medical concerns are. But that will be up to the families. It will not be the school's responsibility to monitor or to keep a list of which parents says mask, which parents says no mask. Uh, that will be the children's responsibility to know and to come to school with a mask or not. Um, and, and, and again, not just accepting that, that um, decision, but also being respectful of the decision. Uh, teachers already and counselors have been preparing for thinking about starting to talk to children about that respect for decisions and not making fun of, not trying to ask people to take masks off. Same thing with adults. Adults to adult uh, masking will be the same thing. Uh, just a, a little update on testing for COVID. We continue our weekly surveillance testing. The overall goal is to keep schools open for in-person instruction. And that was the reason for the shipments we received from the state of over 10,000 tests. 18,000. 18,000 <laughs> 18, rapid tests. Uh, they started, to, they will start to be distributed tomorrow. I know the high school has a plan for a ninth period, also has a plan for, uh, a, for the students who don't have a ninth period class. The elementaries have a plan for distributing uh, the tests. We're distributing four tests to each child and to each adult employee. The idea is, again, to keep schools open so that parents, uh, families who are traveling, families who are concerned about sniffles, uh, just that they will have those tests uh, to be used. And we will have additional tests that we will be able to share uh, again for that same purpose. Uh, regarding the isolation tables, the quarantine and isolation tables that I shared at last week's Board of Education meeting, it was attached to the board summary notes and to the board doc. I also uh, put a link again into this presentation and it's on the district website. It's also going to be important to remember that aside from the general mask requirements regarding isolation and quarantine, masks still will be required. And that's totally separate from the general masking. So re, uh, it, it depends on the isolation period and the quarantine period. So other than that, I turn to the Board of Education for a question. So um, just to set expectations, if somebody is actually surveillance tested and actually ends up testing positive, what's the notification that parents, will, like once we're kind of, once kids are in the school without masks on, what's the notification process for parents that their kid's child has been in the room with somebody? So, positive? so we will continue the notification process our, our new level of notification process that a child in your classroom tested for COVID. Okay. Uh, so we will continue that same notification. Okay. And then the second thing was just, you know, in, in line with kind of communicating to parents starting to talk to their kids about it, I think one of the things that's going to be potentially unnerving for some of the students is actually seeing a teacher without a, without a mask on because it certainly becomes optional for, for teachers as well. And so just just wanted to mention to parents, you know, to really have conversations with their students about, about 
um, teachers are being safe, even if they if they they're not trying to put the students at risk. You know, I think it's important to change in some ways um, kind of the intentions around mask wearing, mm -hmm. and that um, because we've talked about about it so much, and that I think for some of these students, it's going to feel like a little bit of whiplash, and so it'll be important to have those really detailed conversations. I think this is going to create some anxiety for kids, and and we just have to. Um, you know, we have to work together to ease into it, and we have to work together to to, to talk to students about um, the fact that that actually is the way we used to live. Um, and so, so it doesn't feel so, quite so scary. And, and, I, and I would add in the same way that we want the students to understand that if the teacher has decided to unmask, we are also asking our staff to be understanding of the children who have decided to unmask or of their colleagues. And so the idea is to simply to continue to respect one another's individual choices and be cognizant of the fact that people make individual choices, not just for themselves, but uh, also as somebody said, for the people who are living at home with them. And none, no, no one of us, is in a position to be judging somebody else's decision other than with great respect. And um, it, it's, it's really important that we continue in that, in that vein. Um, Victoria, I would, I would just ask for clarification purposes that if a decision comes down on a particular date that mask Masking is no longer mandatory in the public schools in New York State. Does that mean that the next morning, immediately, people will be allowed to unmask? So it, as we know, different pieces of news leak out in different ways and at different times. So I would once again ask that the community wait to receive notification from the school district because there are times when something is said at a news conference, but we haven't received the actual uh, law from the state education department, which we must follow. So I would again ask the community to just wait to receive that notification from the school district. So the reason for having these discussions now is to be ready for that because it's possible, likely it'll happen on a Friday evening. It just seems like that's when all of the emails seem to come <laughs> on a Friday evening or sometimes before the board meeting on Tuesdays. <laughs> So it, it will be one of those times or next week, possibly, uh, when everyone's, a lot of people are away, but uh, please do wait for the communication from the school district. Jennifer. Uh, Victoria, you, you, you mentioned this, but I, I um, would like to emphasize, because I think it bears repeating, you know, this question of mask optional. However, if a child returns from quarantine, in those cases, masks are not optional. It's the quarantine. Correct. Yes, we have to follow the quarantine and rules. Correct. Yes. Yeah, thank you for that. Optional doesn't not 100 percent mean optional. <laughs> not optional if you've been a close contact or you have COVID. And you're within that 10 day period. Correct. Or whatever they change it to better. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Do I have I'd also just like to clarify because I know um, one of the uh, group of students who have been, you know, we've continued to try to have concern around our kids with health issues. And I just wanted to see if you could specify what health issues would qualify um, for, you know, the at-home instruction that you had talked about. Previously. So, yeah, home instruction is available for students who are unable to come to school for medical reasons. And uh, they would need to have, have the supportive medical information to be shared with us, but there is a um, application on the website. Right, and for clarity, it's not on um, a family who has a family member who is correct Ill or um, correct. Who... It's for a child who is um, medically ill. And the child is enrolled in ARDIS. Correct, the child is enrolled in ARDIS. Thank you. Thank you for asking. So one last clarification off of yours, Judy, which is, we're all learning this at the same time, is um, last week we were talking a lot about what decision the board was going to come to around when we were going to unmask and mask. And I don't know if you want to give us kind of a better understanding of kind of what the kind of legal ramifications are for masking sure. and unmasking. 
Sure. So, um, Board of Education and public school districts are required to follow the law of the state of New York. So, when masking became mandatory by the state of New York, uh, boards of education and public schools um, did follow that law. In fact, there were school districts who got sanctioned for trying not to follow that law of masking. And, and likewise, if it's no longer the law, we can't make our own law to mandate masks. We can encourage. Uh, we can um, point parents to information to make their own uh, decisions, but but we will not be able to mandate it legally. Thank you. So, so um, my understanding is as long as uh, you know this whole transition has to happen from respecting diversity away from the health, because you know so far the whole masking has been related to hey it's a health issue, but I think we are moving to a time zone when. You're just saying, hey, you know, it's just one more characteristic of a person. <laughs> somebody's tall, somebody's short, somebody's fat, somebody's thin, somebody wants to mask, somebody's tall. So as long as I think as as people um, kind of really don't look this whole shift from a health angle, but look it from a diversity angle mm -hmm. and respect the value system of a teacher or an aide or a student or a friend or a no friend, then I think as long as that's the value system we keep us carry. I think we'll sail through this, hopefully. Great point. And, and Edna certainly does a, a great job in that regard. And uh, this will give another challenge uh, to, to, to learn through one more diverse uh, aspect of ourselves. Yeah, thank you. Further questions or comments? Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Oh, this, I, I just sorry. wanted to clarify because. Um, I, I thought that it's similar to how Edgemont had in September 2020 enforced masking. Um, that that is the suggestion in terms of like when when I had presented last week, and in terms of having the school enforcing a policy regardless of, of state legislation, whatever comes out. Mm -hmm. I, I, oh, I was just commenting in terms of uh, the suggestion if they do come out saying that. Schools are not allowed to mandate whether or not Edgemont could come out with a policy so still suggesting not mandating. Similar to how in September 20, so not, yes, September 2020, when every child was like everyone needed to wear a mask for the school. Um, and so that's what that I, I think I just wanted to clarify because I think my understanding is that school districts can still, should they choose to, want to enforce a policy. I think we could, you're essentially asking is if the law says something, can we do something different effectively? That yes. Is, and the answer is no. Mm -hmm. And in September 2020, the, the, the governor mandated we had to have masks again. Yes. We didn't do it voluntarily, it was a mandate from the state. In, the, in, the in September 2020, we were all looking forward to coming okay. back to school without masks, and they came down and said, no, you have to wear masks. So, so it, so, was, it was always mandated. We've always followed whatever the mandate was. Okay. Yeah. They never really lifted it. Okay. All right. Sorry. Victoria. <laughs> um, we, yeah, we can move on to the bond updates. So, um, Believe it or not, it was May 18, 2021, that the Edgemont taxpayers voted for a sound investment in their school. Mm -hmm. It's just funny how COVID has changed the whole concept of dates and time and how long ago that was. Um, but thank you to all Edgemont voters who approved two bond propositions totaling $54 million. This allows Edgemont schools to do much needed renovations, replacements, and expansions of our school building which have served many Edgemont students well for many decades. Immediately following the successful bond vote, we began work on the planning, on the financing, and on the construction, following a timeline that would lessen the impact on taxpayers by coinciding with the rolling off of old debt. Tonight, we will bring you up to date on our progress so far and share some milestone dates. And I'd like to turn it over to Brian Paul, Assistant Superintendent, and we also have our architect and our director of facilities uh, who will be available this evening. Thanks, Victoria. 
Um, today we'll take this in a couple of different stages. So we'll talk a little bit about just a, a status update at each of the three locations, CLE, Greenville, and EHS. Um, we'll also take a look a little bit in terms of what's been some of the rationales that have driven decisions to get us to where we are today. Um, as Victoria indicated, John D'Angelo from Fuller D'Angelo, who's our lead architect, will be available to talk a little bit about some milestone timelines for us, tentative dates, but at least gives us direction in terms of where we're going. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the financing and, and where we're at currently in that process and, and where we look to go in the, uh, the coming 12 months, really, uh, 12 to 16 months. Uh, so I think first we'll take a look at Sealy Place. Um, so far today, we've had preliminary site plans and architectural plans drawn for the rear parking lot um, and, and a possible drop-off circle, uh, a new parking lot on Ardsley Road, renovated cafeteria and a surgery, and then significant upgrades to the air conditioning, well, to actually add air conditioning to a significant portion of the building by upgrading the HVAC systems. Uh, namely, this is gonna be done in a few phases. We'll talk a little bit about phase one tonight. Um, what you see here is just a very generic uh, kind of high level overview sketch of some of the work as it relates to the site plan at Sealy Place. Um, we do continue to work with the town regarding the back drop off point, which is the circle that you see in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. We have a traffic consultant coming um, to the district the first week in March. Uh, the consultant expects to have all necessary data collection performed by the end of that week. Uh, and the report that will be produced will follow a few weeks after that. The main objective of that study is to analyze the potential impacts of the construction of either that drop-off traffic circle or a staging lane on Sealy Place, which is hard to see on this right now, but along the uh, back or parallel to the basketball courts. Uh, we continue to explore ideas regarding the current traffic markings on our property, including the um, the is it Kennedy Way, what it's called? Mm -hmm. The actual entrance to, in the direction that we have cars parking, as it may be able to help aid in creating additional queuing lanes for, for the morning drop-off and afternoon pickup. Um, as was discussed earlier through some of the public comments, the town is committed to putting a sidewalk in on Robin Hill Road and is willing to consider making the roads unidirectional to help with the inflow of traffic as it comes into the district. One direction? They're considering looking at one directional pathway to that area at certain points of the day. Uh, we spoke a little bit about the cafeteria serveries at a, at a recent meeting. This is just a, a um, architectural sketch of the new servery to be designed in that space. Um, the work that will be coming this summer will include the renovation of the cafeteria at Sealy Place. As you see in the lower corner, right now there is no serving options. For hot food, uh, we will develop a system that will allow for the serving of hot food prepared off-site, not prepared here because there is no kitchen. Questions have come up in recent uh, months regarding next year. If we're able to complete the work this summer on a cafeteria renovation, will there able to be an opportunity for food service at the elementary schools next year? And the answer currently is no. The reason behind that, is that it is um, everything regarding the serving of the food hinges on the production of food offsite. That production would occur at the high school cafeteria. And we need to complete our renovation of the high school cafeteria and kitchen in order to be able to provide the food in the volume that we need to be able to get it over to the elementary schools. However, we find it prudent to do the work here at both, and I'll talk in a moment about Greenville, at Sealy and Greenville this summer in order to spread the projects out in a way that allows us to actually accomplish this over a period of time um, and not really compounding the sites with too much work at one moment. So I spoke a little bit about that. The traffic study is going to occur next week. These are really the upcoming work items. The HVAC phase one will occur this summer as well at Sealy Place, which will be replacing units on the roof that covers the majority of the building. Doing so in conjunction with the cafeteria survey upgrade will create some logistical challenges on site this summer at Sealy Place and may require us to relocate some of the programs that have used that space in past summers. Uh, we're currently looking at different options, namely at Greenville, to be able to support some of the summer programs that have rented our space or utilized our space in the past, given the construction volume that will be occurring here at Sealy Place. 
Uh, let me actually take a step back. So we'll talk one additional thing. Uh, the parking lot, I spoke about one of the two areas, the, the roundabout and drop-off location on the back of the school. The other area that's been uh, a topic of conversation for us has been the parking lot construction. Um, as we've discussed at a few board meetings, we've talked about two options. And the reason we've had options is that there was a request during the bond development process to explore alternate um, options for parking on the Artsley Road side of the campus, namely by looking at the usage of the Greenville Church's current existing parking lots and the um, mulched pathway that, that currently exists that goes to the playground at Sealy Place. We have done um, a lot of, of looking into this and we'll speak a little bit more about the rationale later in the presentation, but we are ready to make a proposal that we continue and move forward with the original plan uh, that we secured financing for to build a new parking lot off of Ardsley Road on the property with its own pathway, a lit and paved pathway that leads to the Sealy campus. That's the dark gray uh, parking lot you see in the top of the screen there. Um, current plans that we were most recently provided by the uh, architects working with the landscape architects they partner with is that we may be able to bring in about 40 parking spaces into that lot, which is a uh, significant increase from what we had actually originally thought and provides us um, with a real good opportunity to secure this space. Before you jump to Greenville, can I sure. just have clarifying question? Yep. So if I understand you correctly, we have a traffic consultant mm -hmm. who is a professional, who does this as a profession, mm -hmm. who will be coming to evaluate the traffic patterns and to talk with the architect, and you're also speaking, I understand, with the town and coordinating with them as well. So the, the concerns that were raised to the board today will be can, will be addressed by the study. Right. We actually met with our architect and the town engineer and the town traffic. So we all met. Um, we did meet all at the same time and are working on that. And now we're looking for this additional information. They're continuing to gather traffic data for us also. Okay. We've been working very closely with the Greenberg police and their uh, planners and their uh, engineers as well. So we're in contact with them regularly. Because we know that because of school population, there just is a lot more congestion than that. Right. May, may have been when my kids were in the school district and that's really what contributed to a lot of these problems. So, you really need to look at better ways to control the traffic and have places for cars to safely right. drop off children and for children to safely walk. All right. Thank you. I'm just uh, adding to that. Uh, well, I just uh, I want to give Brian a chance to finish his presentation. Can you okay. have more questions until the end? So what, what's best for you? Do you want? I, I actually think it's probably easier to go oh, side okay. by side. Okay. So okay. if we have questions okay. and, and we've got John DeAngelo here as well, so if it's something that's about the specificity. Design that we could talk in as well. Oh, okay. No, no, I'm just uh, kind of tagging to Monica's point. Uh, and we will communicate before we actually start working on these plans to the community so the community is aware of what is coming ahead and it's not such old, so it's not. Shown. That's correct. I'm going to add a third piece on that. I think that, you know, one of the things that would be really helpful is if we have a traffic consultant coming in. To take a kind of a bigger a big picture look at it and to think about kind of the, all the elements of the site and to potentially ask them to think about some operational approaches that might be helpful in managing that right so if we assign drop off points to various different people who wanted to drive if you're kindergarten and you need to park we ask you please to use the arts league you know how are we um, what are some of the operational ways that we can manage traffic across these different areas such that there's no one area that then all of a sudden starts to bear the burden of most of the traffic. Or if we see we introduce enough operational kind of structures so that if we need to change them because we're seeing one area is getting too much um, too much traffic, we can we can use that as a tool to eventually. I don't know if they would have that kind of um, of expertise, but I think that might be something that would be really helpful to look at as well. No, I think that's a great point, and we also have started that conversation with the town planners in terms of when, when you talk about operationalize, we can operationalize who drops off where. Yeah. Right. It doesn't have to be a free-for-all. Right. Who exit which doors with where parents pick up. So yeah. yes, that's, that's all great. part of the work of the traffic and Okay, great. And sorry, just one clarification. And the HVAC upgrade one is not part of the bond. It's it's uh, it's no it is. That that was one of the significant components of, of Sealy Place's plan. 
Sorry. That's not the HVAC work that's being done at the, the junior senior high school using some of the um, American Rescue Plan recovery. This is a separate problem. So, I need to ask is that because you're going to do the HVAC one this year summer, and where's the bond issuance is a year later. So, I'm just trying to understand yep. the cash funds flow this much. So, we'll be using the money that we've secured through the bond anticipation note that will roll into the bond. That's okay. basically for early funding and financing for the, um, and we'll speak about it a little bit later as well, but for the architectural and engineering designs, which is a lot happens up front. Um, but also, we, we secured enough to be able to support that work through the summer. Um, we've got a cash flow report to determine how much we anticipated needing in that 12 month period. And we were able to secure that, allowing us to spread the project out. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else on board? So at, at Greenville, uh, similarly, we have preliminary site and architectural plans now for both the main parking lot, which we <coughs> refer to as the front, but also uh, new traffic patterns that are created through this. The access road that is uh, coming off of Ardley Road to connect to the main parking lot, the new parking lot that is um, near the jug handle that is on Ardley Road currently, and like Sealy Place of renovated cafeteria and surgery. Um, Greenville has more work going on than, than Sealy Place because of a significant addition being added as well. Uh, and we have our, our preliminary plans for that. Um, in terms of timeline in the near future, like Sealy Place, the upcoming work there is the cafeteria and surgery. That will occur this summer. Uh, but again, same outcomes as Sealy Place. We'll have the work done and be ready to implement food service when the high school has done uh, their complete renovation. Um, the work that's that's been proposed uh, through our, our process and approved, uh, if, if we recall, is to create a connection point between the Ardsley Road jug handle and the main parking lot while expanding the main parking lot. Uh, to include both additional staging lanes, which is the gray area on the left side of your screen, and additional parking. Um, we are carrying um, a, a larger uh, voltage and a uh, preparing for electric vehicle charging stations down the road um, and making sure that we have the necessary electrical infrastructure to get out to that main parking lot as well. Whether or not we choose to install electrical uh, vehicle charging stations or not, is, is less of the issue for us right now. In the planning stage, we want to ensure that looking forward to the future and the direction that many car manufacturers are moving, that we are able to at least provide that support while we're doing the work um, to build out these spaces here. On the uh, back side of the campus, down by the jug handle and on the bottom right, you see that additional parking lot that's being constructed. We anticipate that the net increase in parking at the Greenville site will be between 16 and 23 spaces depending on a few variables um, along the way. The addition um, off, of the, um, off of Greenville is proposed to have these five classrooms that you see here currently. Uh, there'll be a, an IT closet to help support our network infrastructure and additional storage created. We've decided to target this space for the sixth graders and reorganize the remaining classrooms throughout the building. A large multi-purpose classroom that you see on the left-hand side uh, will be constructed, which will provide flexibility for a variety of instructional uses and can serve as the backbone of an elementary STEAM program as the curriculum develops and evolves over the next many years. That's the space you see on the left side that has a actually a partition up in the diagram right now, allowing it to be separated into two smaller classrooms, but also to have that retractable wall move in uh, to create a larger space for different Jen Allen, principal of the school, will, will be able to speak a little bit more later today about uh, the decision and rationale behind structuring this as a sixth grade wing. Um, but we're really excited about this. As we know, we've had significant issues as it relates to the, the physical space in Greenville. We've been plugging along and carving out every square inch, not foot, but inch of that space to support our students. Um, and, and this is really going to provide an opportunity to give the flexibility that, that we need in the school. Uh, and I'm really happy with where that design is now. I spoke about the cafeteria already. Oh, sorry, here, here are some elevations um, of that same new space. The one that you see on the front would be, at the top would be the front facing from the parking lot as you enter. The second one down would be coming from, looking from the main entrance of the building to your left. Um, the third down, I believe, would be on the interior side. 
um, looking in between the two buildings. And then the, the final one you see on the bottom is from the parking lot side um, looking in. Uh, so you're still seeing this image in a different orientation, but to get a bit larger, if we turn the cafeteria, uh, this is the current cafeteria with the reorganized um, servery and, and um, kitchen area off in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. You see that dotted line that runs across the middle? If you've been in Greenville, you know there's actually two levels there, it's almost like an upper stage. Uh, this it would used be, to be a stage there you go. <laughs> a long time ago. This would be leveling <laughs> the entire space and creating one level space, um, which, which provides us greater flexibility for the use of students and also um, really helps us get that kitchen area up in that corner. Up there. Um, we've been working with our, not just our architects, but also with our food service providers to understand what would be the necessary equipment to, um, in order to provide the food uh, service that we hope in the future uh, and making sure that we develop a partnership there to put us in the best position to be successful. I, I could pause there again. I think we need to take some quick questions on, on Greenville. That's a question because uh, we're working on the both elementary schools. Uh, one, um, we need to identify which is a critical piece between the two where the work should happen first. And two is, I hope the both don't happen because, you know, uh, the both are elementary school and any resource crunch here can, can, can be used by the other elementary school. So there's some sort of sequential planning for the both of us. Is there any thought like that? For or, which, for the cafeterias? Just for the whole planning between. They'll be simultaneous. Them. There'll be work going on at, at both. Yep. At all, three, at all three sites, there'll be work going on. Simultaneous. And it, you, you talk about the, how the summer program will be shifted from CD mm -hmm. to Greenville and what happens to those programs. Yeah, so right now it's, um, I think the only program really that's been utilizing Sealy is the, the Edgemont, Edgemont Rack the Younger, the, the primary grades. Um, and just thinking ahead and, and trying to plan that there might be with construction vehicles on the roof and also working in, in the cafeteria, it might be prudent for us to move it to Greenville. Greenville would have just the cafeteria um, being worked on, so we can kind of isolate that area and make sure that it's safe. And we can utilize the, the total other opposite end of the campus um, for students. And the second was uh, because we're building this huge driveway, which is run across the school playground. So I just want to make sure that it's happening off peak time school areas times because, you know, that could be a could be hazard for the students which are playing in that area. Yeah, John D'Angelo will speak a little bit more about the timelines, but our, our whole process and our primary goal in the administrative level is to ensure that we do this in a safe way, that we have a careful plan that makes sure that we have areas of campus that are accessible and areas of the campus that are not accessible, and, and that we can assure fidelity with that with our students. Um, and so that, that, I know Victoria has spoken about past projects that she's been involved in. That's a critical lift on our end um, of getting faculty, staff, and students to all be able to understand that we will be in a construction zone for a period of time as we work towards the future. And we just need to make sure that we uh, made it a safe environment. Right. Just a quick question around that, that question around relocation. So it feels like, yes, this year, Sealy is going to be a heavy, and so that makes sense to relocate. Next year, there's going to be site work in both schools in the summer. And are we expecting not to be able to uh, host any of our programs, including ICAP and other programs like that that, are, um, that exist over the summer? And if so, um, is that part of the contingency planning? So, so we have we have had a year like that when we actually had to move all the programs to the high school. Okay. So we had I the high have, school's also gonna be through construction. Well, <laughs> but, but we have areas of the high school. So it, it will become a moving target for sure. We will have to look at each campus and see which is which one has construction and which locations. I know there was one year, for example, that only the gym was available. So we basically look at what's available and, and we make that available to the community in a safe way um, and close off the other areas. Yeah, I don't want to spoil too much of uh, John D'Angelo's fun later today. Uh, he talks a little about timelines, but I think one of the areas, given the, the, the scope of the work at EHS and at Greenville is larger, um, in both cases, we're building additional access roads. We'll see in the timelines tonight, the goal is to, to build out those access roads and let that be the construction um, mm. entrances and so that we can keep, try to preserve as much of the other entrances as, as possible um, so that we're, we're able to kind of stage um, equipment and, and to be able to get access to the machinery that's necessary. Great. Jennifer? 
Just a point of clarification, when you talked about the extra uh, 16 to 23 parking spaces, are those all anticipated to be down on Archley Road or is some or some portion of those going to be up in the main parking lot? Some portion are up in the main parking lot as well. So it's hard to tell from the from the schematics here. Again, it, and I recognize that putting in here. Also, zooming in is almost too granular. There's too much detail here to, to show. Um, but the parts you see in dark gray, that's this is the main parking lot here where Mike, can you see more? Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, this area here that I'm circling right now is, is not paved. There's a, it's almost like a triangular grass um, outcropping there. And I said just there the other day, and I said to Victoria, now that you see it in design, you're like, wow, well, I need to think about you know, doing that at some other point just to build some more spaces in there. This would all be new parking right there. Um, in addition, we create some additional uh, parking and just by striping in, in some of the other areas as well. Um, I say it's 16 to 23 because there's some, some variables involved, but I think the overall uh, site in, increase to both Greenville um, and Sealy will, will be substantial for some of those critical days where we need and also help with the day-to-day -day in a significant way. I'm sorry, the, the audience is, we're not taking questions from oh. the audience. This is a, a meeting for the board to ask questions. When we finish, if there are comments, we'll take some comments. Thank you. Alex, did you have? No, okay. Any any other questions from the board? I moved to, to the junior senior high school. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, a, a lot going on at the junior senior high school, as we know, and similar to Greenville. All the preliminary site plans and architectural plans have been drawn for the access road that comes off of artillery lane, a new parking lot that is coming at the end of that access road, a redesign of the old colony parking lot um, with two independent drop-off loops, one on the old colony side and one immediately adjacent, but separated with a, with a uh, barrier that will be only open for emergency vehicles on the new access road and artillery side of that. The cafeteria and kitchen expansion is far more significant here at, at the junior senior high school um, as we're uh, bringing in additional space, but also trying to redesign the kitchen and the way food is served. Most parents have not been there. Right now it is very much um, feels like herding cattle through lines, um, through narrow passageways. This will be a more open concept to the delivery of food, which should allow us to speed up the process. Um, as well as provide some different options in, in terms of the way that we can uh, utilize that food. Um, a significant building addition off of the current A building, and then a, a renovation to the current A building as it exists to meet our needs. So what you see here again, and, and again, I, I apologize, but don't at the same time, this talk, <laughs> if, if we <laughs> sort of, this is all, John D'Angelo said, us, these are some, uh, there, these are really good. Um, plans at this point. The, the more we zoom in, the more information that comes into play, and it almost becomes too challenging to look at. So, super high level, bird's eye view of this dark uh, passageway being the traditional or new um, access road, drop off circles, and parking lots. What you see in light gray in the middle of the screen is the addition onto the current A building, which is this kind of L shaped building that I'm circling now. The pathway that you see coming from the bottom of the screen is the, the newly reinforced and, and created passageway from artillery. Off to the left, you see that narrower passageway that would be a fortified um, subsurface, a stronger support system to run behind the current B building, C building, and into the main parking lot for emergency vehicle access so that they could get trucks down to the back of the buildings, which they currently cannot do. As the passage, as the roadway moves up, you see these two loops. These are the two parking circles, uh, drop-off circles, sorry. One on the old colony side and one terminating off of the new artillery lane. A new parking lot that comes off of artillery lane and a redesign of the parking lot up on old colony by removing the traffic flow that is currently going through it and making it a parking lot and then separately a, a drop-off point. So cars aren't moving through where, where people are parking as well. And again, there's a separation between those two. Correct. Yeah, the, the, the barrier system would be right where my, my mouse is now, uh, right in between the two circles and loops coming from two different directions. Mm -hmm. So the parking lot over there is just off the artillery, actually. This right here? That's correct. Yep. Yep. Accessible from artillery only. And what, what are the space additions in this? Yeah, that's that's a, a great question. I think I have the number somewhere. Uh, 25, an additional 25 in total on the campus. 
it's actually a little bit smaller old colony lot because when we kind of condense it, move it over and create the room for the circle, but then with the addition of the new lot, the net increases. Okay. Will the parking still remain along artillery with largely junior park now, or we don't know? So that's Town Street. We own the property adjacent to it, but that's a Town Street. So I think that would be, um, that's not necessarily our decision. Okay. Uh, but I, I would argue that similar to what we're doing in Urge Myself, to make, to work with them on that, mm -hmm. because if I, you know, just trying to come in and pick up on artillery right now with those parking spaces, it's impossible to have those parks, those people park, picking up and turning around and, and leaving in that wider road. Now you may be talking about widening the road, I'm not really sure, but but I think we should have those things. I assume right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Especially since we're dealing with a lot of new drivers. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, yeah. Okay. But that is a lot of parking spaces. Yeah. That, yeah. Is that those kids are still going to be driving and would need somewhere else. Yeah, and I think too too early to tell what the net impact is then to student drivers and where they can park on campus. I think one um, observation we could make with an increase of 25 spaces, let's say 25 additional faculty spaces here in the back, what does the impact does that then have on the main lot? I think one area where we'd like to see improvement is some more dedicated um, guest parking spots, possibly parking for traveling staff so it's easier to, to go between buildings. But we also, if we're able to create opportunities for additional student parking as a result of this, that could help alleviate some of that pressure that also occurs there on artillery. Too early to tell for us right now um, what that would be, but that could be one possible. And just to give some perspective, the current parking lot is only for 10 North Town. So it's the current parking that is used well, by the artillery is about only 10 North cars can fit into that lane right now. So it's, it's not a big number that we are displacing a big number. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what the total number is. My guess is a little bit more than that, but I, I don't I don't have a, a hard count. You mean all colonies? No, I think it's about the students who park on artillery. The students who park, the capacity can only hold about 10 odd cars. On artillery? No. Yeah. I think it's a little bit it's more. It's on artillery more than in 10. It's probably, I'm sure they'll do the same traffic and study there and they'll, minds that are well, better trained than any of ours will figure this problem out. Mm -hmm. I think we should have HOV parking. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that we should, like, we do not have a lot of encouragement of students to park. Well, well students school. can't have, until, until a certain point, they can't have non relatives in the car. I understand that. We have plenty of students who can, right? I mean, I think, you know, anyway. It's certainly not. Talk about high occupancy for vehicles. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about, about electric vehicles. Again, the future right. for some of us. That's right. Similar to what we talked about at, at um, Greenville, we are looking into how we can carry the appropriate um, power and, and electrical supplies into one of these two lots um, off of our new access points to be able to build the structure for some electrical vehicle charging stations down the road as well. Just trying to be uh, um, to really think ahead and not, not put ourselves in a position where we recognize 10 years from now that this is a, a necessary that we have to address and we want to be sure that we're prepared to do so. As for the addition and the uh, renovation of the A building, again, this is so disorienting for me because I don't look at it this way normally, but what you're seeing here is actually the kind of completed project, uh, an addition and then the renovation of A, and I'll break them into two separate parts. The part that I just pulled up here is, is the proposed addition. Uh, it's to contain 14 classrooms, including two science labs. The spaces that are being built are targeted for, but not solely dedicated to it. Kyle can speak to this a little bit more later, uh, junior high school students as a way for us to try to consolidate and bring uh, students into one general area of the campus to the extent we can. Once this new addition is built, and that would be the first part of the phase, um, we will then not physically move the students, but in theory, move the classes that are currently existing in the A building now into this building, and then we would begin the renovation on, on the current A building itself. <laughs> Um, as part of the renovation, so here, here is A in its renovated state, uh, we're looking to consolidate some classrooms. So we had to make a couple of decisions. Ultimately, we really want to secure as much possible space as we could because we know our, our space constraints have been challenging. And at the same time, we had to be aware of the fact that some of our classrooms are smaller than uh, are really appropriate for a modern class. Um, and A building more so than some of the others has some that really kind of flirt with that. 
And so we made the decision to do some consolidations of classes while also being able to bring in some important programs into the newly defined space, namely the creation of two STEAM classrooms that you see in the upper part and the inclusion of a new art room on this wing that runs off in the horizontal direction of the side. Where you see that art room and classroom, there are currently three rooms, two of which are very, very small and challenging to schedule given its size right now. And so we do lose one classroom through this process, but we think it's to our benefit long-term uh, to make the right decisions to create classrooms that are of appropriate size. Uh, that classroom right now, you know, one of the benefits for us we see is this, this movement of the art classroom, which is currently right next door in, in the D annex here, will also create some future opportunities for us to assess our current enrollment and enrollment trends to see if we can start to capture some of the space in this building for the district office. Our district office is also uh, constrained in the overall space that we have. And we have a number of district um, positions that are in isolated pockets in different areas of the campus. The idea of consolidating into one general area is something that is favorable to us, but something that we can explore down the road as we look at what enrollment looks like and whether we can capture that classroom for that work. That would be something that could be taken care of in the operating budget. It would not be something that would be uh, requiring bond money to be in terms of the position. Again, just, I can't speak in great detail to but just some elevation plans of the new um, addition. Off, um, off of uh, the current A building and trying to keep the general structure and similarity of, of the type of materials um, and design that we have in our current buildings and to match it to what we see currently in A um, aesthetically. And then lastly at EHS, and, and this is where I said it is a significant difference from what we're doing at the elementary schools to the high school. Um, this is a really important space to us. Um, this is in our, our cafeteria, right now is small for the student population that we have. Um, we have a desire to restructure the way that we do our lunches um, and to consolidate them into um, more unified lunches for students of the same grade. And in doing so, we need more space. We also need additional spaces for students to come and collaborate, um, to have common space, and to have a comfortable area where they might wanna work when they have free time. Uh, right now, we have really one location students can go to the library, which can become congested at times because of the high traffic and, and volume that ends up there. This is a fairly significant expansion in the overall size and square footage. In fact, if, um, if I was to just draw a vertical line right here, this is about where the cafeteria ends now. So this is acquiring significant space out to the right, maintaining a patio, an outdoor area, which is highly utilized by our students to eat when the weather's nice, to do work, while also creating um, different areas and different types um, of seating. I know when I zoom in here on this, you can't see it. This one is titled the Cyber Cafe right now. This, that's just one example of an area where students might utilize that small area different than other areas. The part that you see in blue is the redesign of the kitchen and the servery. It's actually kind of acquiring more space in the back for some of our storage areas and, and maintenance areas and redesigning the way that food is served and delivered uh, through this area here. You'll also note in the upper corner in light blue, there's additional bathrooms. Um, in order for us to be in compliance with the, the volume of, of um, students, faculty, and staff that could be in the area at any one time, uh, the creation of some additional bathroom space adjacent to the teacher's lounge um, will provide really that necessary support that we need while maintaining um, the, the single stall bathrooms that exist currently on that same floor um, outside of the faculty lounge. Brian, mm -hmm. um, what's the current capacity of the cafeteria and what would be expended capacity? It's a great question that I knew the answer last spring and I don't, I don't know off the top of my head right now. Um, John D'Angelo, when you come in later, if you know that, that'd be great, but if not, I, I don't expect to know that. We can look at that for you. If I, if I remember, I, I want to say it was for the 25% increase, but I, I wouldn't quote me on that. Any questions at EHS? So, just on the timeline, sir, most of this CAPEX, except for HVAC and CLE, is going to start in 23 24 school year. And uh, what duration would this project run? How that, long? That's coming soon. I'll, I'll hold up till, till John turns that part. So I think there, there are, are a couple of um, 
there's we had to make some important decisions and, and partnered with um, our administrative team and, and our architectural team and we've spoken with some members of the board and, and also with some teachers to make sure that we understand um, <clears throat> the complexities of some of these decisions so we're going to talk a little bit about these three areas that i've outlined on this slide and, and what's the rationale behind the decisions now i'm going to pass it to the story so i get a sip of water yep. and uh, talk a little bit about Sealy place in the park Yes, thanks, Brian. Thanks so much for the detailed overview. Um, so you may remember we tried a couple of parking pilots at Sealy Place. The first one in October, um, we tried to, we had about 25 slots we were going to try to fill. We ended up with about 10 teachers piloting um, at, at the, the church. And it was very favorable regarding how they felt about access to Arthur Road, access to the school. Um, but the issues were, of course, that the pathway would have to be paved and also lighting. So when we were trying for an additional pilot, it was starting to get dark in the evening. And when teachers were leaving late afternoon, early evening, it was too dark. So um, we, we started to try a second pilot when we roped off the back. And that's when we realized how many people were already dropping off and picking up mm -hmm. in that back. Um, so we ended that pilot immediately um, <laughs> so that we could study that more. But um, as we had conversations with the church and uh, spoke to our attorneys about it as well, we realized that this would have to be a multi-year contract. Um, if we were going to lease property from the church, it would need to be multi-lease. We would need legal agreements. Who's going to pay? How do we pay on their property? Who maintains? Who plows? Who plows early enough for the teachers? Uh, who puts the lighting up? How do we put lighting on property that's not ours? How does that get maintained? So th there were so many long-term issues with the lease. Um, also regarding um, the number of congregations that are also uh, renting the space. If there were uh, any uh, weekend events and people wanted to park at Sealy on the weekends and there are multiple congregations using the church. So there were just a number of factors that we didn't have control over and um, didn't know for how long we would have control. So uh, we discussed this and looked at the control issue of the property, being able to maintain it. Uh, it has already been approved by the taxpayers. And we were happy to hear once we heard the number of parking spots um, being at 40 uh, certainly made the difference as well. And it, at the beginning, we thought it was much less. So we didn't think it would have as much of an impact. But that would provide the paved walkways that we can build and maintain the lighting and the control over the space and the space would be available on the weekends as well. Yeah, I think for, for me, the, the process is long-term stability, ownership of space, the consistency of maintenance, uh, parking volume, and the opportunity that we've already secured the funding for it now, rather than be in a position down the road and, and realize that we would like to recapture that funding again, um, I, I think this puts us in the best position for the long-term. I think one of the things we also learned along the way is that a lot of parents who utilize the church already, um, it, whether they are renting spaces or doing other things in that lot, that, that could still continue. Um, and that is to our benefit as well in terms of the overall traffic and volume, um, that if we provide our own uh, parking lot that assists with this, and that's already occurring, that's already now two areas that are pulling away from any other um, choke point on the campus with the traffic. You know, this has been a really long time coming. Um, for as long as I've been on the board, we've been talking about how to improve uh, parking at Sealy. And I know that there was different conversations about even reverse leasing and things. Mm -hmm. So I know you guys have given this a lot of thought and you've been working on it. And I'm really glad that the funding is available to get this done the right way right now. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other questions on Sealy Place and the restaurants? Anyone? Okay. Great. I'd like to invite uh, Jen Allen from School of Greenville to talk a little bit about the utilization of space in the new addition uh, at Greenville that I showed a little bit earlier. Hi. Can you hear me? 
Uh, Jen, yeah. you're talking to the owl. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so you're just talking to people. <laughs> um, so um, it's very exciting, the prospect of having a meeting. Um, as Brian said, and many of you know from firsthand experience, um, we really literally use every single space we have. Uh, conference rooms or classrooms now. We use nooks and crannies and hallways. Um, and you know, the, the kids and the staff are just incredibly uh, flexible. And that's how we've been able to make this work. But it's it's not sustainable. And so we're incredibly excited. Not up right now. Incredibly excited about the prospect of having an additional wing. Um, you know, the, the layout at Greenville is challenging because you know it, it's so sectioned. Uh, all being one level as opposed, you know, ceiling has floors, but for us, you know, those again who've been there, it can feel like quite a journey to get from one end to the other. And now this will be really a longer journey because of the additional weight. So we really put a lot of thought and brought a lot of different stakeholders together um, multiple times to, to talk about what we think is the best plans for the um, uh, shifts that would occur with the new wind. You know, nothing's carved in stone, things can change, um, but with the information we know now, um, we came up with what we feel is, is a really good plan. The, the group that we put together, and we put it out to all the teachers who would like to get together in order to give input. We met multiple times. We had um, primary grade teachers, upper grade, we had special ed, we had gen ed, we had specials teachers and um, support staff. Um, and really the goal was to keep certain principles in mind. Um, anyone who is familiar with sort of elementary schools work, it's really important to keep grade level together so that they can collaborate and also so that students you can have a lot of programming flexibility at any grade level of sharing students and working and doing projects together that that um, are facilitated by homerooms at a grade level. Um, and even divisions being together, the younger kids being together, the middle elementary being together, the upper being together. But you also want to make um, things, um, areas that are commonly utilized um, accessible to everyone. So for us, versus say when I worked at the high school, you know, you're sitting here saying, well, if we put that there, how long, you know, we're sort of timing it, how long will it take the four year olds? To get from point A to point B, and we have to sort of start thinking about the music of chairs. If we put certain, because um, initially we were saying, well, what if all support services and so forth were in the new and we could design it for that? And we said, but if the four year olds are at the other end of the building, you know, if we have a 30 minute session, it can't take 10 minutes for them to get there. It's <laughs> awesome because they're four and they're traveling, you know. So, so who could have the greater stamina? If they were located further away and get to other locations. And so all of these things were sort of factored in. And we came to the conclusion that sixth grade made the most sense because they could, they were the oldest kids in the building, they could be located further away um, from other areas like getting to the cafeteria, which would now be even further for them. Um, or if they had a gym class in the APR, it would now be at the opposite side of the building. But it's also a question of how can we take this opportunity? We've now gotten, as you know, to, to averaging four sessions per grade level. We're in, I think, our third year of having, and it kind of equals that we have five sections at fourth grade, three at, at fifth, but we're, we're generally averaging and doing ICAP 30 sections per year. And the, the services that are provided, whether it's reading support or math support or, or other things, how could we get them centrally located? In order to make our schedule more efficient. And, um, and this really facilitates doing that by having sixth grade move to the new wing. There's an opportunity here to, to shift some services and things toward the middle hallway, make them more centrally located so that everybody has um, a shorter travel time to get to them. And because those services that are all K6 are really the hub um, of our um, uh, instructional program. So it, it's kind of exciting, not only to give sixth grade sort of this, this new home and, and give them a chance to collaborate and do things that are sort of a, um, as they do now, but even more so sort of a hybrid elementary middle school opportunities for them instructionally um, to have close access to this STEAM STEM 
lab that we're incredibly excited about. Um, and also to, for example, try to give our orchestra program a home, which um, maybe you may know that Brittany Robinson Chen is, is a hero, strapping the bass on her back and pushing the cart as she moves from space to space. And you know, next year, hopefully with lunches back in the cafeteria, we hope that's Brittany's home right now. So she'll go back to strapping the bass on her back and so forth. And, and that's also just not sustainable for a growing orchestra program. So, um, so I, I'm sort of trying to bring to life the, the, the very all the different facets that went into to not just sort of flipping a coin, but just saying it really makes sense. And the domino effect of this move of sixth grade is the great opportunity that provides to have more sustainable space for other programs, to centralize the location of a lot of our services. And um, to just create sort of a, a, a better flow to the building while trying to keep light grade levels as close together as possible so that they can engage in projects and instructional programs together. And um, I think this will achieve that. So we're, we're excited. So thank you for the presentation. Enlightening. <laughs> Any, anybody have any questions or comments? Go ahead. Um, I think that was a very thoughtful presentation. I'm glad some nice people who were involved. I have a current sixth grader at Greenville, so I think a lot of what you're describing makes sense to me in terms of making the sixth graders feel special and kind of that stepping stone also to the middle school. Um, what I wanted to ask was about the STEAM STEM space. Um, as part of the planning, have you started thinking about what the what kinds of programs will go in? Like now that we have the space, like. How, are, how is it going to be utilized? Are there programs that will be ready as soon as it's available? I mean, I think something we've all talked about before, and this will be you know, something to look at in the future, is, is the hope of having perhaps a dedicated special at some point down the road that is technology steam STEM. Um, right now, you know, I think you're aware the elementary specials are to the art, music, and library. We're on a six day schedule, which has many benefits. And we, what we do right now is we take the sixth special and we have um, additional specials. Um, so, one particular home we might have extra art every cycle, and another has extra library, and they get to do more independent projects during that time, which is great and, and they love it. But it makes sense, and we all hope to eventually have an additional special that would be a, a tech. STEM kind of special. Um, so this obviously creates a, an opportunity to have that space to do that. Um, but in the meantime, before that, it's right now, you know, I you can walk into a kindergarten classroom now and see, you know, this incredible STEM projects that they're doing and they're making great use of the space they have. But to be able to schedule a space even until the time that we have someone in hopefully in that position and integrated into our schedule and our program just to have a dedicated piece that has you know really great uh workstations has great um you know it's, it's electric uh it has the electricity to support uh equipment that could be used um we went when we were first sort of dreaming about having like a major space stem space you know we went up to um to Chappaqua and we looked at the one that had come out of there bond and, and you know saw the computer technology and the workstations there's just a lot of opportunity to provide that both for a future formal program and in the interim a space that teachers could, could schedule to come in and take a lot of the projects they're doing now and do them in that space to have guests come in and we have a lot of parents who are in the field who can come in and do a lot of great projects with the kids in, in that space through cultural arts um, among other things. Um, so I think it's got a great short term um, what it can present to our existing staff and then work for the future. Yeah, with just that, I think right now we do a good job of integrating small units of STEAM across the grade, but don't have an articulated program yet at the elementary level. We've made significant progress at the junior high school and at moving into the senior high school as we scaled up from uh, five out of every six day eighth grade tech class to now being a full year eighth grade STEAM program based on Project Lead the Way components, a half year program in seventh grade based on Project Lead the Way. We have a number of different uh, courses across the high school 
where teachers are embedding project lead the way units of study into this. We're continuing to look at our, our computer science programs and the pathways that could be created in conjunction with this. I think that's like phase one to look at in our plan. I think the next phase is to then scale down. How do we develop that same articulated curriculum to work its way um, vertically, but down to the lower grades and utilize the spaces like this to help us support that? Right. We've had a, a huge, like I said, we've had a huge expansion of um, student projects and embedding in the curriculum over the years. I mean, in the fifth grade and the sixth grade, there are a ton of things in kindergarten. We had first grade do the um, you know, spectral project that they do the arch for kids. Um, it really it happens at every grade level. It's really just a question of how can we do it better and maximize the space and you know to be sort of working around the desks to do our you know building our, our pyramids and, and, and so forth. Um, you know, using the cafeteria floor, but only certain certain times because we have to serve lunch there. It you know really just having that opportunity to, to do it right with um, better uh, furniture, better equipment, um, and and really also expanding maybe more into the computer area um, in terms of you know what we're going to do with graphics or design and things like that, and working in concert with our art program to expand what we can do there. Right. I mean, I think there's no question that it's going to be a huge opportunity, but I think that there, you know, it looks like we're not going to be done until 2024. So, and that there's a lot of time to get there. Um, so, I think the last thing that we would want to have happen is to have, you know, the space that everyone is excited about it and wants, but then it just doesn't know how to fully utilize it. Um, because I think major spaces like this kind of amorphous term and so what does that mean and in operationally and, and, and how does that integrate into the life of the kids yeah i, I think there's some um, synergy between that and our budget conversations over the next couple of years as we look at staffing and we look at curricular programs and, and how we want to scale it. um i i I'm not trying to get ahead of anything but i would fully expect that that we'll be looking at that um in the next couple of years if not next year as an option for us great Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I'd like to, yeah, no, go ahead. I'd like to invite yeah. Kyle Hosier, principal of the junior senior high school, to talk yeah. a little bit about the um, the addition and then the renovation and the capturing of that space and uh, some of the decisions that, that have led us to where we are. Um, and I, I should have mentioned this in the beginning. The reason why these decisions matter is that the architectural team then gets a sense of what we're looking to create. Foster, and that matters. You know, it, it's not necessarily that the 14 classrooms that are being built in the new building would look different from afar, but the way that they're trying to structure that, the way they're considering uh, usage of space and storage, what is it that the teachers on those grade levels need to support their programs, all of that matters. And, and it, it's important that, that they have that information to help make sure that we get the goal that we, we want. Yes. So sorry, can I just ask a tangential question? So as we are adding these capacities in Greenville, uh, do we have a spare capacity in Sealy to have a similar program run in the school? So it's a great question. And I think so we're not building at Sealy, uh, but we have been talking and Eve is here tonight as well about what would that look like? And would we be able to provide parallel programs? We absolutely want a consistent curriculum at both places. So it would be the utilization of some of the current spaces that we do have available. Um, Eve, I don't know if you want to share just one of the ideas that, that you thought of that we could use as a way to create um, a steam space at SCLA. Absolutely. We thought of this right away as soon as we heard that DHS and Greenville were going down that road. We have a wonderful science lab that's currently our science lab um, on the first floor across from the nurses room. And we're working with John McCabe to redo the electricity and the sink in there to make it more of a steam space. And then move our official science lab back to the science lab as the curriculum has changed and the water needs are there and the electrical needs are all in the basement. So we're already on that at Sealy Place thinking about what we can do next year just to get those spaces going. So we're really excited about that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. It's almost like we planned it. Thank you, Brian. So again, I just want to take a couple moments to speak about the rationale for consolidating junior high classes in the new A building, which may eventually be called A plus. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a survey was shared with the community early in the bond planning process, 
to better understand the wants and needs of our school community. Our bond proposal and subsequent planning have been rooted in the feedback from that survey from the community. At one point early in the planning process, we considered creating a separate standalone middle school for grades six through eight and a separate high school for grades nine through 12. When we looked at the feedback from the community, it was clear there's simply not support for that approach. While feedback indicated support for our current 7 through 12 model, survey responses highlighted a greater need for separation of junior high students from our high school students. This feedback supports the notion of consolidating junior high students in the VA building. And I'd like to highlight three benefits of this approach. First, when our seventh graders arrive on campus from Sealy and Greenville, we want them to build a new strong community. When junior high classes are scheduled together in the new A building, students will see each other more often, spend more time together, and have an opportunity to build that strong community. Second, our junior high students can learn a lot from juniors and seniors, but there may be some conversations we don't want junior <laughs> high students to overhear. We believe that limiting these interactions just a bit more between junior high students and seniors will help close the gap between students' experience in sixth grade and that experience that they have in seventh grade. Finally, the consolidation of classes in the new A building will still allow high school students to benefit from the newly renovated space. And that's a goal that we want to make sure that we see through many of the plans that we create. There are enough classrooms to consolidate junior high classes and still ensure that high school students get the benefit and experience in being in these new spaces. I'd also like to take a moment um, to acknowledge some of the steps forward that will be made with our STEAM education. Brian mentioned that we have two STEAM classrooms added to the new A building, two science labs, and an art room. The new STEAM classrooms will be just over 1,400 square feet. The current STEAM classrooms are closer to 1,000 square feet, which are just simply too small. <coughs> More space is needed for material, equipment, and the hands-on work that students will do in these spaces. <coughs> Our current STEAM classrooms are in different buildings located across the campus from each other. Our plans have the new STEAM rooms adjacent to one another, allowing our students and teachers to share materials, equipment, and ideas, which we think is a huge step forward. And we're excited for all the work that's to come. We think it's going to greatly enhance students' experience here. So that, I'm going to back over to Brian. Judy? Um, okay, with Jennifer. Um, I, I just want to say I was actually very glad to hear you say that um, the high school students would still benefit from the new space um, because you know the rationale at Greenville is make the sixth graders feel special. And then here we build this wonderful science lab and the uh, juniors and seniors who are doing the more advanced work stay in the old space. So it's, it's I'm glad to hear that you are planning to allow classes at all grade levels <clears throat> on all grade levels to, to use this new wonderful looking on class areas. Yeah, I think uh, we want to make sure that all grades get to experience the new spaces. And I also think from a practical standpoint, when it comes to scheduling, we are not overbuilding. So we're going to have to use all the classrooms that we have. We, we couldn't make this work if high school classes didn't be in uh, this, this new space. Any additional comments or questions from the board? Okay, Kyle, thank you truly for that sure. presentation as well. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Before I uh, introduce John D'Angelo, talk a little bit about timelines. I think just a caveat I want to throw out there. You're going to see um, on the coming slides and in the packets that you've received dates. These are tentative dates. These are nothing to hold anyone to. They are simply about we, we must develop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we put this on the calendar now. We must develop some timeline in order for us to be able to achieve the goals. And, and this is um, due to the hard work of, of John and, and his team uh, to get us started with this. This helps us align our 
approval dates when we need to get plans to the state. Um, it helps me then work backwards in terms of, of securing funding and making sure we don't have funding gaps. Um, and, and this is going to evolve over time. We will, um, at some point soon, be looking to, to hire a construction management firm as well to assist. And with their help, these will be refined in, in significant ways. So benchmarks and milestones, not, not hard dates. And John, with that, uh, I'm going to share my screen, but I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, as Brian said, these are um, our goals right now. Obviously, scheduling will depend on the state approvals and the timeline of, of those approvals up in Albany and also any delays that we might see during construction. Um, the supply chain delays have greatly affected the construction industry and it looks like that's going to occur at least through this summer season. So in looking at the schedule, we try to incorporate some contingencies and some float time uh, that if we do experience some delays in certain aspects, we can, uh, it won't, um, or uh, affect the overall completion dates of the projects. So in looking uh, initially, we've, uh, we've broken out the projects into multiple summers. Uh, the overall bond project will continue at least through 2024. Um, and so breaking it out into multiple summers and multiple phases of the work in order to, to implement it. Um, looking at phase one, which is work um, that we're able to implement uh, quickly uh, that um, has a limited design time, overall collaboration time, where we can get construction documents together relatively quickly. We move to get that uh, submitted to the state and put us in a position to start that construction this summer. So looking at Sealy Place, uh, the projects we, we were able to pull out were the initial upgrades of the ventilation and air conditioning systems and the cafeteria renovations. And we've uh, completed those documents, submitted them to the state in January. Uh, we are expecting approval mid-March. And that will put us in a position to be out to bid this spring award a contract, uh, hopefully in April, and give us some time uh, for uh, ordering materials and getting construction lined up to begin uh, over the summer. Um, the construction will be hoping to be substantially complete by September, uh, but uh, there are probably some aspects that will run into uh, October and November um, that we will plan to do uh, finish work after hours, um, but get the building open in September. Um, the phase two projects would be the continuation of the air conditioning system. Um, that would be a much more significant project as it affects every room in, in the building um, and a lot of infrastructure getting uh, to each classroom, both the ventilation system and uh, air conditioning piping and controls. Um, we're currently working on the schematic designs of those projects. Uh, you saw some of them in this, the site plans. Uh, sorry about the graphics. Uh, those plans are kind of a transition between the conceptual plans and now that we're getting into the engineering and construction documents. So those site plans are, uh, we're working with our engineers in looking at the grading and working in, out the engineering details of the, the road construction and the drainage. Um, but finishing those documents, uh, starting the construction documents now in March, finishing them in early June and submitting that to the state, looking for approval over the summer. And hopefully that will put us in a position to uh, award contracts uh, late summer, early fall, 
uh, which would give us um, significant time to order materials, line up contracts, line up contractors uh, for starting construction in the, the spring. Um, and depending on, on the project, we can, we can start the, the parking lot off Ardsley Road. Um, doesn't affect any, uh, any, any operations at the school. Uh, we can start that early in the spring, as soon as the weather breaks. Um, the overall construction in the building with the ventilation systems, we can start after hours, uh, early, early, um, early spring also. And then once school is over, then we'll, we'll move into the, the occupied areas. Um, it's definitely not a project that can get done in two months. So the more work we can get done uh, prior to school closing in June, um, and we'll work out those specific logistics to minimize disruption, but it'll allow us to get it substantially complete by September of 2023. And so by um, September of 2023, uh, we hope to be uh, substantially complete with the construction at Sealy Place, including the, uh, the site work and the interior HVAC upgrades. Uh, looking at Greenville again, um, similar, breaking it out into, into uh, two summers or, or in Greenville's case, three summers of construction. Uh, the first summer handling the, the renovations to the cafeteria. Um, that's pretty much isolated to that location. It shouldn't affect too much of the rest of the building and um, plan to have that substantially complete uh, for operation uh, in September. And then October, November, doing final closeouts, punch lists and, and completing the project 100%. Um, again, we are proceeding with the contract documents in phase two, which would be the addition and the roadway construction. Uh, overall, the logistics uh, to complete that work would be uh, early spring, start the site work construction. Our goal would be to complete the roadway uh, to, a, to a certain level to allow construction access to the um, east side of the building, the, the to the uh, addition construction area. Uh, so we can segregate that portion of the site from uh, the class uh, students occupied space and the school space. Our overall goal would be during that, uh, during the summer to create, to complete the heavy construction road work, uh, foundations for the addition and steel structure for the addition. Uh, so that in September, we would have that portion of the site isolated with construction access from Ardsley Road um, and be able to continue on the addition construction during the school year. Uh, and then once that's enclosed, continue, complete the interior work. And then the next summer of 2024, uh, completing or the... Uh, the summer of 2023 into the school year of 2024, complete the addition. And uh, if, we, uh, if we stay on schedule, the possibility of opening up the addition uh, at the end of the Christmas break uh, in the, the beginning of 2024. Now looking at the, uh, the high school, I'll, I'll stay at uh, start with the A building addition and kind of look at that separate from the cafeteria. And the, the construction goals here are similar to Greenville in that the first summer of uh, 2023, depending on um, the programs in the school and uh, how early we can start 
uh, construction. Um, we would start in the spring, extend through the construction. The goal would be to complete the roadway construction from Artillery Lane, again, utilizing that for construction access to the A building addition site um, so that we can complete the, uh, the roadway construction and the foundations and steel framing for the new addition by September, then be able to segregate that portion of the site um, from, from the rest of the site to separate the construction from any student occupied areas, then continue with the, the construction of the A building addition, um, and then uh, move on to the roadway. Again, keeping that segregated, uh, the new parking areas and completing that addition. Uh, that addition construction would continue um, until the summer of 2024. In September of 2024, the new addition would open. Uh, we would utilize the classroom spaces in the new addition um, and then start construction on the renovation the, the, at the end of the school year in 2024 prior to uh, the addition opening, op and, and which would open up in September and then utilize the school year of 2024 to complete the renovations in the uh, existing A building portion, the renovated portion, and then have that space completed and ready for occupancy in September of 2025. So that would be a two phase operation uh, building the addition, then transferring students and emptying out the uh, existing A building. Um, similar construction to the cafeteria. The, the goal at the cafeteria, breaking it into two separate phases, the renovation work, and then starting the addition work. And then uh, in the September of 2023, being able to open up the new servery and new kitchen uh, and the renovated portion of the cafeteria, but having a temporary wall between the renovated portion and the new addition, which would allow construction in the new addition to continue through September of 2023, and then completing the, that addition um, some months later for oper uh, occupancy in September of 2024. So we're looking at the logistics. As Brian mentioned, we'll be bringing on a construction management firm uh, shortly who will uh, work with us um, to, to develop this plan. Right now, it's, it's tentative. As we start to get um, a little more specific, we'll be looking within the schools at specific programs that might have to be altered. Uh, specific um, traffic routes, access to the site that might have to be adjusted uh, in order to get uh, the construction um, done. Our goal is to uh, work that out well in advance, give everybody plenty of notice um, so there won't be any surprises during the construction operations uh, and with limited obviously disrupt, disruption to any of the programs. Thank you, John. Uh, I know that's a, a lot to unpack and there's a lot of data there. <laughs> yeah. uh, so let's open up for any questions that anyone has. I think the one area that I would just point out before that, just to reiterate one of the points we made about the elementary cafeterias, if you look at the last uh, slide there, the substantial completion for the kitchen and serving area at the high school, 9123. So that would then be the earliest that we would be able to implement food service program um, at the elementary schools once we had that developed. Yeah. Yeah. Pass it to the board for any questions. So there are a lot of dates, but uh, the one date which is uh, completely in our hand is the submission date of SED. 
So uh, I hope I will not hold you accountable for any other dates, but uh, I hope we can hold you accountable for the SED submission dates. Uh, and as long as we hold on to that, uh, hopefully the state kind of comes back to. And so I just want to get a feedback. Are, are we on track? Because there's a lot of June first date, and are we on track to meet those submission dates? Yes. So, yeah, okay. I think that, and, and those are the dates that we have control of. So we're, we're pushing, we're on track right now. Um, administration and, and the, all the team members have uh, really been behind us and uh, giving us the data we need. So working together, I, I feel confident we'll, we can meet those dates. Got it. And the second thing I noticed that uh, we cannot do any bidding till the state approval comes. So as any delay on state approval means uh, sequentially everything goes back by exactly the same amount because we cannot do any bidding at all for any part of the project unless that piece gets approved. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And, and one last question, uh, you know, as we go across these timelines, the inflation is high and there could be some uh, delays in the material. So what kind of contingency we have on our overall CAPEX because we have a limit of 54 million, we come to 57. How do we kind of, or just let's, I'm not putting the numbers, but what would be the approach of the school district in case of any, uh, you know, we kind of go, ex we exceed the targets that we have put for a bit. I think that's a great question, John. You might be able to part of it. I, I can certainly answer from the school district side. In the development of the number that we that we came to, we did embed some of those uh, understandings, and we know that there need to be some contingencies along the way for escalating costs, especially given the length of this project timeline. So we knew this wasn't a one year out from once we submitted. We already had state approval for this. Um, we knew it was going to be a few years, and so we did embed um, some of that escalating costs in the materials. Um, we also can address any additional concerns that we have within the operating budget. Uh, we do have a, a budget line for district-wide improvements uh, that we utilize in a variety of ways. We might in one year need to target that if we were to exceed um, what our outcomes were. We also have some control over what we transfer to capital um, each year in our budget process uh, to determine capital projects that we might want to take on. If we had a sense that there was a part of this project that we were going to need to subsidize a different way, we could address that in the year preceding it with um, our, our budget as well. Uh, we don't currently, we, we have a capital fund. We do not currently have a capital reserve. Uh, it's something that we can also look into um, with additional funds. If we have surpluses, it's possibly creation of a capital reserve, which is a vote in, vote out model. So you have to vote the money in. You also have to vote the money out for projects. Um, but that vote is, in on the board or vote in the community? Community, community, community. vote. Yes, it's it's part of the budget. That's you can do a separate budget vote. Account. You can do a separate vote for, but there, um, you know, that is another reserve that we don't currently have, like our teacher retirement system and, and employer retirement system reserves. That could be a way to, to put away some money as well for some contingencies that we could look into. And, and my, my question is very specific because, you know, we have not seen these kind of inflation in the last 20, 30 years. And um, timber prices are 100% plus, inflation 10%. We, we haven't seen numbers. And I'm just worried on um, kind of what kind of uh, risk that we are looking forward to and what can we do about it i don't have any solution but i'm, I'm just kind of escalating it that uh, we think about those numbers and kind of strategy and maybe do something in our budget working session yeah. um i i actually have it somewhat related to to one of malicious questions um given how much hinges off of um approval of the plans um are these optimistic Pessimistic estimates based on what you know the state of the department in Albany. Um, do, do you have any sense of? of... Um, their their estimates based on their current timeline and getting approvals on on recent projects that we we've sent up. Um, so I, I I guess we we would consider it optimistic. Uh, it it definitely won't get shorter i'm sure but it could could extend out um, we do have some additional time built into most of the schedules that if that delays if, if we are delayed on those approvals um it, it won't affect uh, we, we have some built-in delay space 
So I'm, I'm not too concerned yet on the, on next year's work. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if this year's work gets delayed, we don't have that much float time uh, between now and uh, getting construction started in June. So uh, if, if we are delayed by a month in Albany, it, it could affect the summer construction this summer. I think we, when we initially had gone through the process of development and, and trying to secure um, the financing for this, I think there were a lot of concerns about the timeline for that. Um, I, I know John McCabe and I had a call with somebody which they, they actually give some metrics about like what the average turnaround time is at the given point. The complexity of the project matters in terms of what can be approved and how quickly, uh, but it, it seems like the current project timeline is, is not um, it's not vastly different from past years. It's not an elongated uh, model like what was being told to us early through the COVID months and then we're taking over. Okay. Buddy, did you need? Nope. Okay. Yes, there's a question. Anybody else on the board have a question? All right. John, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, John. No problem. John, thank you. Oh, the question on the cafeteria, the, the current capacity is about 200 and we'll uh, just about doubling it. Thank you. It looks like it was loud. It looks yeah. huge. Thanks, no, John. That was no better than my, my recollection. <laughs> <laughs> that exactly. Hopefully be part of the plan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Hang on one second. We just got one more part of this. All right, so I think financing matters so much, right? And all of this, and I think the reason why we go into such detail on those milestone timelines is we want to make sure that we don't have funding gaps. Um, I think we took a, a real significant step and, and had the opportunity to do so, given how historically low the interest rates were this past year, to secure a bond anticipation note, which is essentially early financing for the long term obligation that we're going to take on. Uh, we took that in total $3.8 million, and that was based off of John and his team's work to give us a construction timeline for the 12 months and cost estimates for it. To date, we've only spent, uh, we secured that in September, we've only spent $310,000 out of that. That seems like, wow, we must have taken too much. That's going to escalate really quickly when we get into actual construction phases this summer. Uh, so we, we believe that that will secure us for, for this early part, uh, but we have a couple of options as, as we move forward. So as you saw, the, the, the whole timeline is elongated. We have a, a lot of time to cover in this process. We can do one of two things when this uh, bond anticipation note comes to maturation, which is on September 1st of this year. We can either roll it over and increase the funding level for a subsequent year. So for example, if John and his team put together a construction timeline and cost estimate for the next 12 months, and that was another eight to $10 million, we could then, utilize that information to secure a ban that would increase the funding to that to cover us for 12 months, ensure no funds in that. The other option in, in reality uh, might be the more preferred one to start to look at this is we could secure the entire bond at that point in time or sometime soon after this. The bond that, that we have been approved is for $54,121,125. We make our first interest and uh, principal payment somewhere within the first 12 months. 12 months being the latest, we can ask for it earlier if we wanted to structure it that way. Our ultimate goal from, from the very beginning was to make sure that the financing that, that supported this project occurred when the debt from our previous bond rolled off. So that previous bond will roll off in the 20 to 23 school year. So we want our first principal and interest payment on the new bond to be in the 23, 24. Given that we have a 12 month window for the determination of when our payments begin, we could secure the, the bond early and ensure that the payments are still in the next school year while giving us the funding upfront. That hinges on SED approval. We need to have the project packaged to be able to do so. So the reality is, is that some combination of the two is likely to be the direction that we will go. Secure some short term ban that we will roll directly into it and then probably try to secure the bond a little bit earlier than waiting until the, the actual school year changes over because we have that window of time for when our payments are due. Brian, excuse me if I'm completely off base on this, but 
if we secure the money early, is there any penalty that we would have to pay to pay it back? Nope. Okay. No, I mean, one could say that that you're possibly not matching the timeline with the anticipated lifespan of the project to the actual, but in reality, we're talking about months at that point. The reason that we might want to do this as opposed to just going with the band is that as we can anticipate now, interest rates are going to increase over time. The historically low ballpark that we were in last year for a band is no longer historically low, it's low. Um, I had spoke with our advisors today and you know, he made an estimation that we might be somewhere right now if we went out the bond in the 2% range, more likely down the road, somewhere closer to two and a half, three to higher, again, estimates. We don't know what this will look like. Um, we're not in the ones anymore. And so it might be to our advantage to capitalize on that and get ahead of it before it, it keeps going. Because every every half percent point that we could save would be a significant savings to the district. And given our options in terms of the timeline for payments, we, we have some flexibility here in terms of it. It's too early to, to make that decision, um, but this was just one of the conversations with our advisors that we had today. And we'll continue to do so over the coming months to make sure that we have funding um, in place. I'll be working with uh, John D'Angelo to make sure we can get a construction timeline and cost estimates for 12 months. And, and we'll take a look at all of our options at that point in time in terms of what's the best way to proceed. Yeah. So, so two questions. So if, if you raise a bond early and the money comes to the bank uh, of Edgemont School District, where is that money lying during the phase where it's not being utilized? Great. So it's in the capital fund for us. Uh, we do earn very small interest on that right now, again, through our, our very federally secured ways of, of investing. And the second is, uh, I completely agree that uh, as long as we have that SED approval or SED filing, I don't know which is sensitive to raising the bond, uh, um, it, it's a pretty reasonable uh, guess to make that the numbers will be flat or higher. They will not be lower for sure. <laughs> Correct. So, so with that kind of resumption, uh, um, I think the bias is in favor of doing it early, but uh, it's all subject to SED approvals. Uh, Correct. Um, right. it, you know, if we if we had SED approval before the ban was to come to maturation, then we definitely have choices. If not, we, we might need to do a short term holdover between the two. But I think either way, I, I'm not. Um, I, I do not have concerns right now about having a funding gap uh, that that would limit the work that we can do. Okay. And, and the last thing, and when do the state aid start coming in on the bond that you raised? Uh, what is the mismatch between the raising the fund and the money coming in? And, and again, I think we shared the numbers in the past that we are expecting X percentage and we're budgeting X. Yep. Can you throw some? Yeah, we wouldn't see any of this. That's a great question. We will not see any effect. So if uh, 23 4, we incur the additional uh, debt payments on this, we're not going to see any state aid effect in that year on that. We would, only, we would first see that in the subsequent year in 24, 25. Oh, because you can't apply for state aid on anything until we actually issue the bond. So even correct. the stuff that you do in that first summer, even if we consider a project finished, we can't submit that until we have the full bond issue. So if, if we finish and close out a project yeah. um, and submit our final reports, by, I, don't, I don't actually know what the cutoff date is, but there is some cutoff date. We then are able to uh, get aid on. I see. But the I'd have to look in terms of what you know, like Sealy Place Phase One HVAC. That's not. I'm not sure how the, how that yeah. has to play out. That's yeah. something I can look into. Right. Yeah. They don't care how it was funded, right? It's more that you correct spent the money and it's it's checked off and done right. what you said you were going to. Final cost do. reports need to be submitted and, and verified before they can issue aid. Yeah. On that. So yeah. I'd have to look at what what is the. Um, the drop dead date for, for each of those. Mm -hmm. and again. I don't know that we would actually be in a scenario where we would want to do this, but I just didn't want to make sure in terms of what our options are. Um, and I think we did this with the last fund, right? If, for example, let's say one phase of the project <coughs> was being held up with the SED, got SED approval on pieces of it, but not on the whole thing <coughs> pushed out. Could we also, as an option, Split the bond, bond the stuff that's yep. approved, but if we want to lock those rates mm -hmm. in. Yep. But yeah, so we, we spoke about that. Again, I was speaking with our, our advisors at Capital Markets. We did speak about that today as one of the options as well. I think that's one of those we'll take a look at as we get closer, but that is a, a, a possibility. Thank you. Um, so 
at what point do we know the full duration of the bond based on the projects that we've submitted and therefore kind of what the actual um, debt allocation is going to be on an annual basis? Great. So what we will want to do is try to match up the length and duration of the bond with what the approved um, anticipated useful lifespan on, on the project. The state will get that to us, that calculation. And what they will what we will do is probably come up with a hybrid of those states because the projects are going to have different uh, useful lifespans, right. given additions versus renovations versus site work. Um, and so we'll, we'll want to create a, a hybrid of that. So at so they at give us that number for each individual project, and That's we correct, create yeah. the hybrid yeah. and then go out to the bond with that hybrid. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And again, I mean, I know we talked about this fairly extensively when we were talking about the bond before. We don't have any particular limitations, correct, in terms of what we can or can't do. There's obviously plenty of reasons to be prudent about matching that up. But for example, you could have a project that is 10 year lifespan, but you felt like you had to spread out the payments over 20 years, right. but that's yeah. obviously got its problem. Really? That's correct. Right. So, but, but but the aid comes in over that whatever the duration they say. So you want to be careful about not mismatching that right. either. What's only to, aidable is the years that you actually that's are. Correct. Gotcha. So let's say right. just, just use some numbers. Let's yeah. say yeah. ten years aidable. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. On that, we we ideally wouldn't want to spread it over fifteen years. Right. Because those last five years, then we take the full yeah. cost mm -hmm. without the supporting aid to offset. Gotcha. And the way that Alex described it is exactly true. And just to follow up with that question, so initially there'll be a hit because we won't be getting aid, okay. and hence uh, while they won't, we don't want to take a hit in the fifteenth year, but the first year there will be some hit. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Right. So you could have a scenario, right? You you could calculate it so that the end of your payments were at the end of that aid period, or you could, if it was a fifteen-year, you know, sort of aidable period. You could do your 15 year financing at the beginning and then you'd get some aid at the end, actually after your your payments on that bond had yeah, yeah, but, done. Yeah, but, but but there could be a first the first year could be a tough year. Yep. Yes, because, exactly. Uh, because you won't get aid definitely for the first year. You, you can try to be yep. uh, close to the final planning, yep. but the first year is yep. going to be tough. Yeah. Well, so just to be clear, and, and we can talk more about this as we get closer, because I think like it's very confusing and it probably it begs some charts and graphs and stuff. But um, but I think that just, just to make it really practical, you might get hit into this, but we've got we've now got $54 million in the bank and a debt service allowance that's the same every year, right? So it's not that we're going to get a big tax hit that year or anything like that. It's that we're going to spend down against that $54 million more than we would, and then we're going to refund that with state aid that comes in. Is that correct? Well, I think you know, let's just saying it's in year one. Let's just say that yeah. that um, interest and principal payments were five hundred thousand right. dollars. We we may not be receiving any aid on that five hundred thousand right. dollars offset. So the impact in year one might be greater than what the subsequent impact is in the next year when we're getting thirty percent aid on that as well. Right, but when you say impact, we're not talking about the, that the taxpayers are going to have to pay for the extra dollars and cents associated with that. Well, it, well it's, we have debt service as part of our, our obligation. I understand. So, so sorry. I just want to be very clear about this. We we are going to see ups and downs in our first few years of this bond because we're not getting state aid, or we have a debt service that is a dollar figure. The debt service will remain the same. Right. The debt service remains the same. Mm -hmm. So we have a building aid dollar figure that will shift, That's which correct. we have every year anyway. Yep. And by the way, we're still receiving building aid on previous projects. That's so we'll, still, we'll continue to receive building aid on previous projects. But the assumed building aid in that first year may be less than what it will be in year two, three, four. Fine. Yeah. So, so, so we will manage that within the budget as opposed to it being shifting in debt service and all these other kind of things. The debt service yeah, will stay the same. Thing. Right. It's the right. aid that we receive that will be. Right, which we manage already. That's we correct. manage shifts in, in state aid that come in building aid that come already. And in fact, sometimes we get a windfall in building aid that were unexpected and we and That's we correct. kind of manage that against the, the other. Expenses. Right. We we might choose in the first year or something to pull some out of reserves to exactly smooth that out. I just want to make so sure that we're not know. like, you know, we're not gonna create this bumpy road for everybody around like what they did, because this is a big project. So yep. it's, that's a huge distinction. I think to bridge this with a conversation we've had previously, I think the, the foundation aid increase this year yeah. and then the subsequent expected foundation increase next year, a 
aligns really well with the acquisition of additional debt. Yeah. Because we can use that also to help us bridge uh, that gap in the near one. Yeah. But having said all that, given that it's a state data, uh, I think uh, first year especially would be bumpy and rough and you'll have to kind of do kind of a lot of dipping into the reserves to kind of smoothen it out. But there could be first, I, I just want to be make sure that the community understands that this is not something in our control, but there could be the, the very first year could be very rough for the, just for that number and how do we manage it is a different issue, but from a cash flow perspective, it could be very Thanks for the doom and gloom. The thing I think I think the thing is that what Marikita and Brian have actually been talking about is whether it's whether it's higher or lower, higher in all likelihood during that first year plus, we have the capacity within our budget to move things around to make sure that things maintain at an even level in terms of the uh, effect on the taxpayers. Well, so taxpayers so, and programs. Also. Well, I, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case, right? Like, well, that that's so. so that's, I think that if this is all like we're we're talking about. We don't we don't have the numbers in front of us yet. So I think at some point we need to do we need to have this conversation with the numbers in front of us. But like, we can only take out of the ERS and TRS what we pay that year. We can't take extra money out of there to cover construction and things. So there's so, definitely like some limitations around that. But I think one of the things that we should be thinking about as we look at Refunding reserves and, and and managing budget against taking out of reserves is where might we need a little bit more support for the few for the couple of years where we where our building aid is not going to be coming in yet and we're going to have substantial outlays um, in terms of new debt service. So when we did the original estimates, when we ran our original calculators for when we were talking to the public about the bond, we used and what was going to be our average expectation for for debt service and building aid on top of it? So what Nilesh is saying is, it's like we're going to kind of like you know ease our way into that number, which may and actually may end up at lower than that number eventually when all when we're getting a tremendous amount of building aid. Um, I just want to make sure that we don't like that the objective is for us to manage against that as opposed to to have taxes follow that that line as well. So the bumpiness is on us to manage the budget around it as opposed to on the public to actually um, pay, pay for that distinction. As we do every year with everything. Right, that was what I was trying to But again, uh, just to kind of add to one more point, you know, the, the CAPEX is not part of the, the budget cap. So, you know, so this is not uh, going to be part of the, any kind of a state cap that is there on the budget. And, and again, you know, with all the due benefit uh, for the long-term planning, uh, I think it will require a lot of creativity for the first year. So I'm just kind of putting that uh, uh, up front. Uh, uh, I'm not kind of putting any doom and gloom. I'm just saying that we need to be clear on how do we kind of address that issue. More I think than it. everything that's been said is true. Yeah. And I think that one of the areas we talked about foundation aid, I think it's been, we talked about the creativity. Yes, we're already thinking about those things. I think that that provides us the greatest opportunity to make sure that we're able to smooth any increase that we might see by the, the additional funding that is likely to come from the state. Um, yes, looking at reserves as well, we are able to uh, put a, a significant amount, actually the maximum that we could in TRS and ERS last year. Um, again, looking at currently this year, and we'll talk more in the, in the coming weeks about how much we can put aside is trying to prepare ourselves for this year. Uh, those are some of the creative ways, not all of them. Um, I'll hold some of the more creative ones possibly for a later date if necessary. Um, but yes, those, those all of those things are, are on our minds. Um, and, and I do think it will require some creativity. Our goal, as always, will be to try to maintain uh, a fairly steady increase if needed, uh, but to not see spikes if, if necessary in the tax rate. And that, that's always been a goal of the board and, and of the board. Thank you. I hear um, EHS bake sales are really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> they're allowed to get it. Yeah, they're allowed to get Yeah. Any other questions? John D'Angelo, if you're still there, I, I, I wish you a great evening. Thank you for hanging in here. This do you morning. want to ask the public if they have any questions? Did you, yeah. did you, ask them any questions? Did you have a comment or a question? <laughs> no, 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 no. There's nothing in the spreadsheet. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right. And then we have just one additional update. I'll, I'll try to be brief on this one. Um, this is highlighted as bond and revenue. We talked about revenue sources a, a few weeks ago. One of the areas that came up was universal pre-K. 
Um, and on the, the governor's proposal, you saw that there's a $216,000 um, award of, of state aid as a possibility for us. At the same time, there were articles in the paper about Edgemont having a, a universal pre-K program. We told you we do a little bit more research on it, and I've learned a lot about <laughs> universal pre-K, something that we've never had before. So I'll share a, a brief summary of where we're at, and then looking to see some direction from the board in terms of how you want us to proceed. Um, there are 17 school districts in Westchester County that have a universal pre-K program that's of the 40 schools right now. Um, there are a few, like us, who got additional awards of funding for this in the last two years as part of a federal program to provide greater access um, of, of a universal full day pre-kindergarten program for all students. Currently, we do collect some data on our students coming in. In the last two years, 95% of our students have entered kindergarten. Sorry, I should say different. 95% of those who reported to us, not everyone completed the survey, but the vast majority of uh, those who did enter did complete, indicated that their children attended a full day um, um, formal pre K program before coming into our kindergarten schools. It's worth noting that in that time, it's also COVID, and there were some individuals. Um, in the responses who indicated their reason for not doing so was because of COVID and concerns for health, not because of their desire to or ability to put their child in a, in a uh, pre kindergarten setting. The state um, in their, their designation, the $216,000 comes from a straight per pupil calculation that they are awarding us for 40 seats. 40 seats into $216,000 is about $5,400. Is <laughs> that, that is the aid that they will provide for pupils. Here's the way the sequence would work. If we decided that we wanted to create a universal pre-K program, we would approve that here. We would then start to develop the structures of the program, what we need. There are many of them. There are many requirements. It becomes, we become the owner of the um, curriculum to an extent, or I should say, um, collaborator and viewer of the curriculum. Um, and same is true as it relates to certification for those who are in the programs. The program does not need to be housed in district. It doesn't need to be our staff. Many of those 17 schools we spoke of have had a full-fledged universal pre-K program in their schools for a number of years. We can outsource it. So what we would have to do is do an RFP, send it to um, local child care centers, uh, pre-K programs, in-house programs, certified by the state in our area, give them really clear terms as to what we can do. For example, if we didn't want this to be something that then bled into the operating budget and it now becomes a supporting a, an additional grade, or at least a quarter of a grade in our budget, we would have to dictate terms like the maximum payment that we can um, pay per child is $5,400. Um, forgetting what the other term is that I wanted to point out, but we would have to articulate that really clearly and see if any local agency would be able to meet those terms for us. Would it have to be physically within the bounds of Edgemont? No, no. no. It could, but we want to make sure that if you think about transportation, mm -hmm. if it's something outside of a, a certain um, geographic area, this and then we need to provide transportation. That's a whole other. Well, effectively, be more more right. but no, there are local places that are outside. Say, effectively, of, it would have to be within that time. Um, there are neighboring ones that I, I looked at that are close enough. I think that we. Can. Okay. But um, so, just to be clear, when you talk about local, like, like Greenville Community Church, could be someone we could say that. But that's the edge. Right. You know, I'm, I know, I'm thinking just, of another just, one. Creative Beginnings is in Greenberg. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's outside, maybe in Hartsdale, I'm not sure, outside of our jurisdiction, but it's very close. Mm -hmm. like, um, neighboring districts that have done this have, have sent out RFPs to those in their areas, and some, because of lack of response, have had to reach a little bit outside as well. So the I'll, I'll throw just a couple more things out there. So I, I spoke to some colleagues in other districts, some similar to us who are getting a per pupil expenditure of, around that same number. I've gotten no response because either they, they deemed it to be not profitable for them or they may be full. Um, those could be reasons as to why. Um, other districts have had long standing partnerships because of the, the program that they developed, partnering with YMCAs, et cetera, who have been able to honor rates for, for a longer period of time. 
I said we have 40 seats. The classes by state definition are 18 max. So that was the other thing I was gonna say. We would have to dictate probably two classes, 36 is the max we could take on. The classes need to be fully populated by students in our UPK program. It could not be a mix of students that they already have and we just you know, filter in others. In essence, the teachers of that class need to be certified teachers or on path to get certification within six months. They would be employees. And I'm only saying this, we know we don't have space to do this in-house. So the option for us would be, would be a, an outsourcing model. Uh, they would be employees of that agency, yet collaborating with us, we would be required to provide a professional development for them um, and overseeing the curriculum to make sure that it is aligned with and in a trajectory toward our kindergarten program, typically done through site visits, uh, directors of curriculum work with them, elementary principals would work with them. We would make sure that we had a, a collaborative model to work with. We don't know what the interest would be for families, but we also, I don't know that we would have responses to an RFP. So I think if, if this is something we want to pursue further, I think the only approach we could take next would be to develop an RFP, send it out and find out if there are agencies that are even willing to, at that rate, accept students in that way. I would be concerned with us developing uh, the other way of thinking of what's the interest from the community and then come to find out that we actually don't have any, any agencies that could provide the support at, at that cost uh, for us. Anything beyond those costs, whether it relates to food service, um, the professional development I spoke of earlier, all that comes out of operating budgets in other schools if they exceed that cost. There are some schools that have funded this almost like 50-50 over the years. There are some schools who have set hard caps like that, like that's all we can pay. It is either a fully sustainable program where the money that comes in supports it and we provide the service to the district or, or we do nothing because we're not gonna bring that on to um, the operating budget. Yeah. Um, I'm how do you limit it to 40 students? Great question. So if, if uh, so what you do is you have to set a date and it is a random selection of those applicants that have applied. If, so I'm gonna use 36 as our number just because I don't know how we would make another classroom out of, out of that that would be supported. But if we had more than 30, if we had less than 36 applicants and they will all be able to get in by the deadline set, Anyone who applied after that, it would be on a first come, first serve basis, including you build the 36. Months. So we are permitted to limit it. And, and are we? Yes. And is it first come, first serve the only way we can limit it, or can we also limit it by um, economics? We cannot. Okay. We, we could limit it to 18 if we if we deem that's what was, we thought that that bid could go out, or maybe that is the only bid that we could get back, is that 18. And no, it would I mean, just be a random selection. Of the applicant. If we wanted to make it available to families that maybe weren't as economically advantaged, as just below it, it has to be random. Okay, ladies, equity. Um, the question I have is: Do we we don't get the two sixteen? We get five fifty four hundred times however many students. Correct. Pay. Yeah, right. So, yeah. and if we have thirty six, we offer it to thirty six people and only. You know, 28 people. We get 28 back, and we're, we, we, back we and might be contracted for 36. Right. Yep. I mean, I don't, I don't understand how anybody makes this economically feasible. Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and and just to be clear, if we got those those 26, we'd be talking about like two classes of 13. We wouldn't be filling out with right. the classes right. with. We we would have to articulate our our terms in the RP and determine if somebody was willing to accept those. It would be my guess in most cases that we would be looking at two classes of 18. If we had 26, we we're going to be contractually on the hook for the 36, 18, and 18. Mm -hmm. Because but, I don't know how they could support that without the, that funding. Yeah. But my point is that the, those extra 10 seats just go unfilled. Yeah. We would be, That's correct. Which means we don't get money. We don't correct. get paid more. Either. You get back when we fill out our cost report, we get back in aid the students who actually attended for that program. Mm -hmm. At 5400 per student. And just to understand, and the federal government has sent this money out to try this, and if you don't, then we have to refund that money back. No, we, we won't receive it unless we use oh, it. Oh, okay. Yep. So, so, so like the other aid model, we talk of building aid, 
it's based on what we actually realize. So it's a design for optics, not for stuff. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry to say that. <laughs> sure. So basically, I mean, it looks like the only way we could do it is at a loss, how much of a loss that would be. I mean, realistically, that's probably the case. And unfortunately, you can't, they say, find a way to target those seven kids who currently are not getting the degree. If you could do that, you might say, oh, I'll take a little bit of a loss to, you know, make sure those kids get access, but you can't control if they're the ones that actually get the access yeah. to it. Yeah. Correct. Now, I, I do want to say, some of my colleagues that I spoke to who are getting the same funding, 5,400 per pupil, have been able to support two and three classrooms in, in their own districts. So I don't know. In their that, facility. No, no, outsourcing it. Outsourcing it. And so we're getting real deep into some of the rationale yeah. of why, but these centers may be because it is a school day, it has to be 180 days. So now it's become very, very school right? 180 days, um, five and a half hours, five hours. I forget the details, but that's it. That's what the 5400 is. Most childcare centers are open longer because the parents need a longer duration of time for them. Some centers may be willing to accept this because they may then get parent funding for the before and the after. Mm -hmm. And when they think about 5,400 plus whatever they're asking of the parents for the shoulders on that, it might become an economically viable model for them um, because it's, it is it would require additional funding from the parents, not the district. We can't fund those outside parts with the, the child care. Basically, it's like a $5,400 coupon for the parents right. to get a full year of so, yeah. like for example, right. Tuckahoe. Right. Right. Tuckahoe has a, about half our population. They get the same funding, fifty-four hundred per student. They were able to. They like where we are now. Got something off the ground very late last year, um, out in May. Um, put the program together. It actually got a one-month late start because of the, the timing for that. They're now trying to find ways to get one hundred eighty days out of that to ensure. Um, and they were able to to produce, I believe, two classes out of that. And found a, a child care center a vendor who was willing to accept the terms of that. So I, I just, I don't, we don't know our appetite for that right now. Uh, I guess that's the all the question is, I think, I don't know if we need to make the decision tonight. I don't think it actually impacts our budget in any significant way. My recommendation would be at this point that if we do dip our toes into this, that we, that we do so in a way that is sustainable with the funding that comes. Um, and if that is the case, that's not going to adjust our budget conversations in the coming weeks. It's something we can continue to discuss as to whether we want to um, move forward with creating an RFP and, and seeking out um, if there, there are any services out there that would be willing to accept. Brian, there are two factors that occur to me. I'm just going to throw them out that we might have to consider. I know that there are transportation distance parameters mm -hmm. by age. Yeah. I would imagine that could kick in for that us even um, shorter distance for the younger set. I don't know, but at the very least, we're talking about- Two miles. Two miles. Mm -hmm. oh, well, two miles I thought was for the height. No. Okay. Uh, three at the high school, two. Two, okay, fine. And and, and so that could be a, yep. a, a funding factor. Um, and the second is just to consider, right now the state is willing to put out this money of 216 maps, but what, what happens when it dries up and the program exists, are we under, Illegal out. Okay. No, no obligation to continue. Fine. And, and I guess the first thing I should point out, we're no obligation to do this. Right. Right. Anyway. right. right. And I didn't know once we started. Yeah. Okay. No, in fact, many It's always school... hard to take anything away once you give them the people. Right. And again, there's many more details, but yes, there's very specific parameters on who is eligible. This is not for any child under kindergarten age. It's for those specifically who have a birth date after December 1st and will be entering kindergarten next year. Our entry is actually December 31st, so we'd probably be December 31st and forward, have to have a plan to be entering kindergarten the next year. There, it, it's not just an open, this isn't child care for all in many ages. Oh, I was just gonna say that the other possible consequence, but I don't know, maybe this is because it's so small, it doesn't matter, but just the staffing consequence, because I, I assume there's just like at least some administrative, like nobody's doing it right now, so. Sure, Th thank you for bringing that up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, yes, so I, I have asked my, my colleagues yeah. another what's the impact as well? Um, yeah, there is there is administrative oversight and, and work. Some of the areas that they pointed out today were areas I wouldn't have even thought of. For example, if a child is not attending, 
then what happens there? Um, you know, how do, is, is it reportable? Are we able to get the aid on that? Uh, does that become just a, a cost of the district? Uh, obviously, I mentioned some of the curricular you know, areas. This, this means it's a true partnership if you go down this route. And so it means bringing additional people in, into the loop. Um, and there is additional oversight that, that we can't quantify necessarily with a number or time, but, but you're correct. It would mean this is more and we have to weigh that as well. Well, and, and it doesn't lead to any sort of distinction in our programming because we're talking about 40 children and we're talking about a kindergarten class of a hundred and some odd children. And so it's not substantial enough to say that we can modify our our kindergarten program to be a follow on to this. So we are still assuming that everybody coming into our kindergarten program are coming from a variety of different places, a variety of different backgrounds, not still a normalization year. So I, you know, I just think it's not, um, it's actually not fiscally responsible for us yeah, to, agree. to embark on that. I agree. I, I think it's, I think it's a nightmare. If, if I don't see a community need for it, and if we can't start to use it to help those who cannot afford it. I see no reason for us to go down this road. Thank you, everybody. Um, can we document this in some way so that next year when it shows up on the, <laughs> on the state aid, we have a really good kind of way to go back. We all shift, and et cetera. So I just want to make sure that we can. So Judy, I just I would ask, I'm not asking for a vote, but I'm just wondering if to try to read our, our okay. is, do is we not want do we is want there anybody who wants to move forward on this? Going once, going twice. I think that's happy happening. to have community feedback if, there, if somebody in the community feels differently and wants sure. to forward. And wants to have a community. conversation with us. Yeah. Night Logan. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, look at that. Oh, okay. Thank you. That, that's all I have. Okay. Thank Sorry for that. That was thank a lot. Okay. No, thank you, Brian. You have a comment. You said you have a comment. Yeah, actually, um, it is appropriate. I don't know if you want to go first. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> is the floor open for commentary on everything that's been spoken as far on the CPA? Yeah, but it would have to keep to the uh, right, few yeah. minutes. Okay. Uh, very quickly, it's it's uh, your concern that might not be sufficient interest from the community, but if you program I'll tell you that I said that would be very interested. Um so to the extent you know you're still open to that. Um that's my uh plug. Um but yeah then going back to um the bond project uh so thank you all for uh very detailed presentations <laughs> and I'll try to be very brief because because the detail uh there's uh, quite a bit of time spent going over the this game quickly. Um, but just wanted to uh, get a sense for uh, maybe there was a response from the superintendency of the board uh, regarding the comments that were made by myself and other neighbors about traffic safety options, specifically the um, provision of a crossing guard. Anyone here has details on what the high school is doing in terms of rotational program among faculty? I don't know the details on that, uh, or if the school district has had any interactions with the police department to discuss this. And so I understand you're communicating with public works. And you're kind of a, a bit in the dark there. So what so, the yeah. So so the way the comment period works as a general rule is oh. that we take in your comments, we listen to them. Okay. But this is not a form for us answering public comments. This okay. is a forum for us to hear the reports from the superintendent and to discuss and ask questions to get clarification. Your specific comments, Victoria's taking notes. Okay. We will try at some subsequent point. I don't want to promise a specific time, but get back to you okay. with um, the information that you're you're seeking. Um, I, I think that's about the best that we can do at this, okay, at this point. Right. Okay, it, it's not that we're not listening, we are listening. We can't then, um, we don't necessarily have the information available, sure. and most of the time it just requires doing some background work okay. to, to respond appropriately. Okay, okay, all right. So, to follow up on that, uh, it seems like this is pretty much done the strategy, the circle behind the ceiling, the no. the one. No, there are the traffic consultants coming. So it's not decided by any. Another proposal. 
proposal. The proposal. There's right. funding for that if we choose to go that direction. So all the, the again, thanks for detailed presentation. But it's, it's very detailed and you know, helpful. Uh, all the work that I see being done around Sealy, Greenville, even at the high school, is geared towards vehicles, right? Towards drivers. We're trying to solve that problem, which is great for drivers. But can we consider here at any point the impact on uh, pedestrians? Because there's a lot of kids that won't, I don't know about Greenville, but I'm very familiar with Sealy where we live at. There's a lot of people who walk to school. Especially the, the R Street on Logger Hill, it's the main the artery for, for the people to walk back and forth. Have we done that analysis? How is it, all of these projects specifically on the suicide? side? How is that going to impact this kids that walk to school? Especially if we want to take a longer view, right, and, and promote walking and healthy living and all of that. I feel the electric cars are great, <laughs> right? But cities are becoming more walk friendly, right? More, you know, friendly for pedestrians, for biking and, and other uh, measures like that. So, or are we trying to solve this simply by accommodating cars, vehicles, electric? Or, you know, we, 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 these answers to these questions, which are all very important to the district and to the board, yeah. are things that we need information from the traffic study at the very least. I will say that a lot of the additional roadways that are planned were planned with very specifically the desperate need for a secondary access for emergency vehicles. And so that is the background to the basis for some of those plans. But insofar as uh, the needs of the community, that, that's something, and the walkers, um, which we obviously want to encourage, that is something that we need some more time to, to get some more information from. Just maybe on a, a procedural level, um, how will we know when the results from the traffic uh, consultants will be available to discuss public and um, maybe speak on behalf of some of the neighborhood? It's been tough to necessarily get a sense for what is going to be on the agenda and when. Um, so, just do you have a, a sense for how that will be communicated to neighbors? And, Victoria, well, it'll be on the Board of Education agenda. So, board updates, uh, just like tonight's bond update, it'll be a bond update. Uh, anything related to the bond, anything related to decision making uh, related to the bond will happen at the board level. Brian, you give a date for the traffic consultant, right? Yeah, they hope to wrap up the work at the end of the first week of March and then, yeah. Whenever we get a report from that. Yeah, a few weeks after that is the hope. What that means in terms of how we synthesize that and, and how we share that out yet to be determined. We have to take a look at what comes in and, and, and how that's going to help us. And given that we have the budget that we're working on, I'm guessing it won't be before March 8th at this point for sure. Uh, no, I, I can. Yeah, yeah I, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep checking the website. Okay. I just okay. also wanted to say, like, more specifically that. Part of the reason for even looking into the traffic flow of vehicles specifically was to try to safeguard the pedestrians. For yeah. like at Greenville, there are many, many, and there's always backup and just trying to figure out what is the optimal traffic flow that will allow the kids to travel safely. And we do have, you know, parking guards at or crossing guards at multiple um, high traffic areas, but that is not sufficient to address it. So we're looking at more. You know, kind of aggressive measures to address it, and it has to involve the park because the kids are being that's kind of what well, I just have a few old from a good place in the country, so sometimes I'm right across the board, right? Totally, so it's we're yeah. trying to take a comprehensive yeah. look at it. No, no, it's totally thanks for the good. Yeah, sure. If you invite yeah, like more cars, you know, if you buy building more traffic, you know. Uh, facilitating, you know, laying them, you know, parking spots, and right more cars, you'll take more cars. Well, I don't know if we're inviting it's for a car, and I think we're just trying to manage the the overflow we have. So, agreed, but my point is, right, so, uh, you know what, uh, uh, yeah, we're redistributing. Yeah, all right, we need that. Yeah, yeah we, we, we really need to wrap this up. I'm sorry.
if you, if you want to have a, 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 a conversation, I would be happy to have a conversation. No more than I do. Okay. All right. Thank you. And, and seriously, thank you all for your comments. We do appreciate it. Um, okay. So next on the agenda, I think that one's yours. Is mine. Yeah. I'd like to G1, say G1 yours. out of order. Um, so we have a What's the procedure? I mean, they direct the resolution. Okay, so whereas the Board of Education has conducted an extensive search for a distinguished educator to serve as superintendent of schools to succeed Dr. Victoria S. Newell upon her retirement, effective June 30, 2022, therefore be it resolved that Dr. Kenneth Hamilton be and hereby is appointed to serve as superintendent of schools for a three-year term commencing on July 1, 2022, and be it further resolved that the three-year employment agreement heretofore executed by Dr. Hamilton and Ms. Judy C. Seitz, acting in her capacity as president of the Board of Education and subject to ratification by the Board of Education, be and hereby is ratified and approved, and be it further resolved that this resolution shall take effect immediately. Um, do I have a motion? I think he said, second, Jennifer. Are there any comments? Okay. May I have so, a uh, I, I would just like to commend uh, everybody on the board for the amount of effort and the time they put. I would like to commend uh, Dahlia, uh, Marigita, Monica for doing all the groundwork and then everybody for the amount of time they put and uh, for the rounds of interviews with it. So I'm thankful to have colleagues like this and, and great job. <laughs> Alex? I was just briefly say there will be lots more time to talk about this later, but I want to say while we are very excited about having Dr. Hamilton on, we are very sad about losing Victoria, but we will yeah, obviously talk more about that in the future. You took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. Jennifer. <laughs> I wanted to echo what Lish was saying because I mean this was when people ask me how it went, I, I think this was the board at its best. Um, you know, we, we had thoughtful discussions and it was a lot of work and even more work by Monica Marakita and Doya, but it was also exhilarating. And so I wanted to thank all of you for for this <laughs> for this experience i just want to say that i think that we um i'm very excited for the community to meet dr hamilton i think he is going to be um a great uh, next step for our district and bring um lots of care and compassion for what makes Edmont really special but also um creativity and excitement for what what might bring us to the next stage and so I'm, I'm really excited for everybody to meet uh, Dr. Hamilton on the, for everybody who's here um, and who wants to join us to meet Dr. Hamilton on the 28th and then certainly over the course of the next, the rest of the spring and into the summer um, um, to kind of start to engage with, uh, with him about kind of what, what he's about and how, what he's going to bring, but also what their expectations are. And I, I go ahead. So I just want to thank the entire board, um, especially Gloria and Marikita. You guys were a dream to work with. I just think you guys are super smart. You, you know, one of the reasons I, personal reasons I wanted to be on the board was to work with smart um, people who would um, help me learn. And I really felt that way working with you and all of you on here on this board. It really, I actually looked forward to the interviews. I mean, and sitting with you guys and talking with you guys. And I, I just think you're an incredible group of people. We all have different thoughts. We all really listen. And a shout out to the school board nominating committee and any members who serve on that committee. The work you do creates great boards. You're, 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 you're sifting through people with agendas and you're getting people who are, are looking to the heart of doing the work of this board, not passing agendas, but working towards student-centered, school-centered work. And you guys are just phenomenal. And I really I have enjoyed the time. Uh, I just want to add a touch of that. There are 
always people who bring a different perspective to our questioning. And in that regard, on this subject and on almost every other, I, I absolutely laud Nilesh's perspective. Mm -hmm. Everybody brings something oh, really important. But with Nilesh, you time and time again, sometimes to, to the point of, of, I don't even know how you get to that, <laughs> to that way of thinking, but it has been utterly invaluable. I, I, I don't want to go on too long. So I thank everybody. <laughs> I, it has been an absolute pleasure going through this process. Everybody says, oh, aren't you exhausted? No, it was exhilarating. It really was um, to, to share this uh, experience with you all. So thank you all. And then to commend uh, Dr. Hamilton for making us feel like moving forward in the right direction with this district in the same path, but with just new ideas that are the same and different. <laughs> and, and there was a very clear understanding that we had with him that we very much felt like this was home. This was this was a, a really good match for, for all of us. Um, and so we are really excited. So with that, I, I ask for a vote to accept this resolution all in favor. And it is unanimous. Um, so Victoria, do you want to take the remainder of the consent agenda? Yeah, I'd like to ask the words of approval of G number two, H students number one, I business numbers one through six. Do I have a motion? Alex first, Noah second, all in favor? And that is unanimous. Great. And our schedule of meetings, okay. The next meeting is on Monday, February 28th, at which we will welcome Dr. Hamilton uh, and to introduce him to the community. Um, and that will be in the auditorium, not in the de Um And that, that will begin, the public session will actually begin at 8 p.m. On March 8th, we will have our budget work session. Uh, we're gonna do that here? Budget work session. Here. Okay, we'll do the budget work session here. Again, that will be at 8 p.m. Or 7 p.m. No, I think we're going to start that at 7. I think we have that early. Yeah, start that I think we start that at 7 p.m. And then, <laughs> and then on uh, March 22nd, a regular board meeting also here in the Deonics, and that will be at 8 p.m. Uh, and with that, we are.